of the 1987 World Series presents Monday Night Baseball from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. The New York Mets against the Montreal Expos. The Mets will send Dwight Gooden to the mound tonight as he seeks a third straight victory since his return. And one man he'll be facing is last year's National League batting champion, Tim Raines, who's picked up where he left off in 86. Olympic Stadium in Montreal, site of the 1976 Summer Olympics. The Expos moved here in 1977, and a decade later, they finally have the roof in place. And thus, we have four domed stadiums in baseball now in Houston, Minneapolis, Seattle, and here in Montreal, home of the Expos, the third place Expos against the fourth place New York Mets. Hi everyone, I'm Al Michaels. Welcome to Montreal. And you could have gotten gigantic odds before the season started that Montreal would be in front of New York in the National League East standings in the middle of June. But the Mets, as has been well documented, with enormous pitching problems. The Expos have played much better than anybody anticipated. They, of course, lost Andre Dawson to Chicago. They did get Tim Raines back after he had opted for free agency. And the Jeff Reardon trade, which was so maligned here in Montreal, seems to, at least at this point, have worked in Montreal's favor. So here are the Expos, six and a half back against the Mets, who are seven and a half games back of the St. Louis Cardinals. Great to be joined tonight by Tim McCarver, who not only covers baseball for us but watches the Mets on an everyday basis you have seen just about every game that Dwight Gooden has pitched him what about his first two outings now since he has come back from the drug rehabilitation well Al, I, I don't think the Mets were really concerned about the physical presence or performance of Dwight Gooden however they were concerned about how he would accept everything mentally as a matter of fact that's one reason that he started at Shea Stadium on June 5th he is 2 and 0 he won that game against the Pittsburgh Pirates and then last Wednesday at Wrigley Field in Chicago he beat the Chicago Cubs handily 13 to 2 and he struck out 10 and walked no one from what I've seen of him so far he's had a dynamic curveball a good fastball not overpowering like he was two years ago but I think it's a little premature to compare him with two years ago what has his return meant to the attitude of this ball club <laughs> well the attitude obviously is that the Mets have lost six pitchers from the ten uh, that they broke camp with and that's the big reason that they welcome Doc back with open arms. Well they try to go three and oh tonight and his pitching opponent will be a man by the name of Dennis Martinez and as I turn now to Jim Palmer for so many years you were in the rotation in Baltimore with Dennis Martinez who in essence is trying to make a comeback here in Montreal now. Well Dennis also had some problems with alcohol. Uh, he pitched here for the Expos last year was three and six became a free agent did not sign went to Miami in the minor leagues signed a uh, about the fourth of May uh, with their Indianapolis Triple A team here in the Expos and he pitched the other night and pitched very well. There's a typical game when you're pitching against Dwight Gooden you know you have to pitch well and for the Expos to do well tonight. Dennis is going to have to go out and do his job. During the offseason, the fans here were mad. UB Brooks was mad. Tim Wallach was very mad. They felt that uh, the front office just wasn't putting together the type of team that could be competitive. And yet here they are, only six and a half games out of first place. How? Well, it's a, it's a positive attitude, and I think they surprised themselves. I talked to Bobby Winkles, the hitting instructor. I said, how are you going to do? He said, we were going to struggle. They were 11 and 16 in spring training. They have just played so much better than they expected. They've surprised not only everybody else, but themselves. So they're a team that can be de destined with. Uh, they have 290 uh, runs scored, just like the Mets. So they're a good ball club. First of a four-game series under the Dome in Canada as the New York Mets take on the Montreal Expos on Monday Night Baseball. ABC's Monday Night Baseball is brought to you by the heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. By Michelob, so exceptionally smooth the night belongs to Michelob. And by Mr. Goodwrench. No one knows your GM car better than Mr. Goodwrench.
Here's the Mets lineup tonight. Len Dykstra is the leadoff hitter, and then Tim Tuffle, who is now the everyday second baseman, Backman disabled. Keith Hernandez, per usual, hits third. Gary Carter is the cleanup hitter. Daryl Strawberry, who had a very active week, is in right field. Kevin McReynolds is in left. Howard Johnson bats seventh. Rafael Santana, he's been hot, batting eighth. And on the mound is Dwight Gooden. Meeting going on at home plate right now. Manager Buck Rogers of Montreal and Davey Johnson of the Mets, along with the umpires. And three of the four umpires worked in Pittsburgh over the weekend. Lee Wire will be behind the plate tonight. Ed Montague is at first base. Tom Hallion will be at second. And Dutch Renner, who was the plate umpire in Pittsburgh yesterday, will be at third. Renner was forced to eject Davey Johnson and John Mitchell because in yesterday's game, Pirates starting pitcher Brian Fisher hit Tim Tuffle. Both managers were warned if there was any retaliation that the pitcher and manager would subsequently be thrown out. And so, and you were there, Tim, in Pittsburgh yesterday when John Mitchell rushed back Brian Fisher. John was gone, and so was Davey. And the whole thing stemmed from Daryl Strawberry being hit by Bob Kipper on Saturday night. And I asked Dutch, who was the home plate umpire yesterday, of course, if the umpiring crew had discussed issuing the warning to both managers before the game. He said they had discussed it, but that they felt that the events that happened the night before were not serious enough to warrant a warning. A warning. And consequently, when Fisher hit Tuffle, there was a warning, and then Mitchell threw close to Fisher, and Mitchell and Davey Johnson were ejected. But kind of an inequity in that rule because, after all, the Mets had two players hit and three players ejected. That's right. <laughs> and the Pirates had none hit, none ejected, and wound up splitting the two games. The Expos take the field. Well, with that as background, and just to follow up on what took place, Daryl Strawberry reflects on the incident the other night when he charged the mound and charged Bob Kipper. Well, yes, um, there, there's been a couple times I had problems with um, left-hand pitchers over there in the um, Pittsburgh um, staff. You know, they say they want to pitch me in, but Kipper's had, he's got great control. You know, he really had He's pitched me in a lot, and he's had great success pitching in against me. But at that particular time, I felt he was throwing at me, and I was kind of frustrated about a lot of things. And I, I didn't know at that particular time they had made a new rule about charging the mound, and you, you ejected from the game right away. And you know, next time I know better. I think um, I kind of just, like I said, I took my anger out and kind of lost my head in that situation and went out there. And it was, a, it was a, it was a bad mistake because I, I, I think I kind of cost the ball club. A uh, big loss with my with my bat being out of the lineup because we end up losing the ball game three to two. Very honest admission, and I know Davy Johnson was interested when we interviewed Daryl, and there are the Montreal Expos defensively as to what Strawberry said. And Davy, I think, was very pleasantly surprised that Daryl admitted that he had made a mistake the other night and had uh, taken the blame for that loss. Davy obviously concerned about Daryl Strawberry because Strawberry showed up late last Tuesday in Chicago. He was fined, and he Johnson didn't have him in the lineup on Wednesday. He did, however, play in the exhibition game on Thursday, and things are all right now between them, but only all right tonight. <laughs> well, yeah, Davey right. talked. I talked to him at the batting cage, and he was talking about the fact that if Daryl was his 12-year-old son, that he would take him into a room and explain the facts of life. And I think a lot of times part of baseball is making mistakes, learning from him, which he admitted. And also, you'll have a player like Darrell who's 25, yet he may be a little less mature than other players that are 25. So maybe Davey ought to take him in the room and have the talk with him. You can't always assume, especially in this game. Speaking of sons and speaking of Strawberry, a happy birthday to Darrell's two-year-old, Darrell Jr. in Los Angeles tonight. So the Mets come into Montreal, and the Mets certainly not out of the race by any stretch of the imagination. Seven and a half back, but the way the Cardinals are going, and the way things are developing in the National League East, I don't think anybody in that Met clubhouse is going to be very comfortable if they fall too much further back. As Len Dykstra starts things off, Dykstra, Tuffle, and Hernandez, three men hitting better than 300 to lead off in the first. What seems so impressive 
to me about the Cardinals is the way they're winning games. They're doing exactly the way they did it in 1985. Good defense. They've had some injuries, as the Mets have had, and they're leading the National League in runs scored. So they're doing a lot of things well, and that's why they had the lead. Dennis Martinez in his second start since being called up takes high for a ball. Does Dykstra and the count is 1 0. Talked a little bit earlier about how impressive Dennis was the other night against Pittsburgh. Seven innings, three hits, two runs. Fastball, curveball, slider, changeup pitcher, but he had an excellent curveball the other night. Good fastball over 90 miles per hour. In the opening, we talked about a alcohol problem that he had, which we hope that he is really beaten and I think when you talk to Dennis he will say that's a problem that's always going to linger I'm going to have to address that problem on a daily basis and he's been able to do that the last couple of years one ball one strike the count on Dykstra leading off in the top of the first inning Martinez first came up with Baltimore way back in 1976 had several productive years with the Orioles twice he won 16 games once a 15 game winner and a total of 111 big league wins then sent to Montreal last year became a free agent ineligible to come back with the same club until the first of May so he opted to work in Florida in a ball little squibber back to him and Dykstra has gone for the first out one down a perfect example of that good curveball established the fastball got ahead threw him a curve and an easy comebacker. What I always liked about Dennis Al is that the, the fact that he has good work habits and really if you look at his career it's really been two two careers before the alcohol problem and after uh, before he was 82 and 57 and over the last three years he's 29 and 42 so he came here last year out of rehabilitation program in Rochester struggled had some arm problems it was three and six but Bob Rogers the manager here in Montreal liked the way he threw the ball. He works now on Tim Tuffle and the count is one and oh Tim Tuffle who normally is platoon with Wally Backman drove in nine runs last week Backman wound up being placed on the disabled list as he pulled up lane pulled his hamstring in Chicago and Tim Tuffle is a much better hitter against right handed pitching than he is against left handers even though his career stats are dead even 266 both ways. Two and all the count. Bob Rogers, who managed Milwaukee and was the manager in Milwaukee the year they won the pennant. The only problem was Buck wasn't around at the end. He was replaced by Harvey Keene in midseason. And Tuffle is on. So Tim walks on four pitches, and the Mets have a runner at first base with one gun. And it brings up Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez now starting to drive in runs even though his stats are fairly impressive he was not coming through in a lot of clutch situations in late April and early May and was taking a little bit of heat in New York for not producing that's been really the problem problems of the Mets offense matter of fact they're a little bit better as far as a team batting average is concerned this year but it's they're hitting with runners in scoring position that has alarmed Davy Johnson. They're only batting 234 as a team with runners in scoring position. So they're getting the hits but they're not getting them when they count until recently. Tuffle at first base with one out. One and oh. Still Hernandez despite his problems with men in scoring position is the ultimate model of consistency. Three years ago he had 311. Two years ago he had 309. Last year he hit 310, and tonight he comes in batting 308. So I make you throw strikes. You talk about banking on somebody. Nine times he's won the Gold Glove. I mean he can do a lot of things for you. It's like having a pitching coach in the infield. If you watch him, he is very much into the game with every at bat, but also when he's out in the field. So of course a lot of people. Our Keith Hernandez detractors because of the RBIs. He hits a high fly ball to right field, and the versatile one, the rookie Casey Candell, gets underneath it to make the catch for the second out. Duffel retreating to first, and with Hernandez now the captain of the Mets, as denoted by that C, trots back Gary Carter and his nine game hitting streak come to the plate. 
with a typical Montreal reaction. He was so popular here for so many years, but then once he left in that trade three years ago, that was the end of the love affair. But a few old friends do remain. Strike on one. That's what friends are for. <laughs> Thank you, Dion. <laughs> oh, one pitch. Missing in the count, one ball and one strike on Carter. As usual, playing through a lot of pain. And Carter with. Good success here, at least in terms of driving in runs since his departure. Tough will really no threat to run. You mentioned the pain that Carter is playing in. Of course, all catchers do play in pain, but Gary Carter has had more than his share so far this year. The foul tips off his feet. You see that padding on his left foot. Lessen the blow a bit. Also, three days ago, Jay Harwitz, the public relations director of the New York Mets, informs us that Gary switched to steel-toed shoes. I'm a little bit surprised that more catchers don't use those. Steel-toed shoes and that padding as well to protect against any foul ball off his front foot. In there for a strike, and the count is two and two. One of those little respect pitches. You can see the the look from Gary Carter. Said that ball's high, but a two-one changeup will get your respect. Of course, the reason for that is is that Carter not hitting for a lot of power this year, but year in and year out, one of these guys that does not strike out a whole lot, but does hit somewhere around 30 home runs. Last year with the injury, only 22. Little grounder down to short, and UB Brooks. Throws to first to retire the side, and the Mets are done in the top of the first. And after a half in Montreal, it's the Mets nothing. And the Expos coming up. Lineup tonight for the Montreal Expos. The good looking rookie Casey Candell leads off, and Herm Winningham, ex Met, bats second. Tim Raines, last year's batting champ, bats third. Cleanup hitter is the third baseman, Tim Wallach. Yubi Brooks is back in the lineup. He bats fifth. Andres Galarraga having a great season. Bats sixth. Vance Law, the steady second baseman. Jeff Reed over from Minnesota does the catching, and there's Dennis Martinez. And the Mets defensively tonight. McReynolds in left, Dykstra in center, Strawberry in right. The infield of Johnson at third, Santana the shortstop. Tuffle at second, and Hernandez at first with Gary Carter back of the plate. And Dwight Gooden on the mound and the story well known and well documented the admission of cocaine use the rehabilitation through April brought back slowly in May worked his way up through triple A pitching for Tidewater and then the Mets noting or putting a spotlight on the date of June the 5th some three weeks prior to that night knowing they would be at home where it would be more comfortable for Gooden to break in and a big crowd looked on on that Friday night a week ago Friday as he beat the Bucks and then came back to beat Chicago on Wednesday so he is two and oh. I think an interesting thing that you talked about Tim in the opening of the show was that he, he was so impressive with his curveball that you sometimes forget about the 94 mile per hour fastball that goes with it. But I think in talking to Davey and I think the reason that you talked about that was that his curveball was very much like it was in 1985. And you're going to a year where he was 24 and 4 with a 153 earn run average. That's amazing. Casey Candell leads things off for Montreal. Candell is hitting 302. And that's the highest average for any rookie in the league. The only others above the 270 mark who have 75 or more plate appearances Benito Santiago of San Diego and the Mets Dave Magadan. Bob Rogers talked about Casey Candell. He said we had him in spring training. 
excellent year last year at Indianapolis. We knew he'd be a utility player and had no idea that he would play so much. Three and one the count. I think you'll see Candell taking here, but that's something I've never seen Gooden do. He went into that deep knee bend, which makes one believe that he's not quite loose yet. Three and two. Well, Dwight talked about, I said, how do you pitch here? And he said, well, I either do real well or real bad. <laughs> No middle of the road here. Keep searching for mediocrity, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everybody else has a lock on it, and he's searching for it. Yeah. Not much mediocrity in his career. Oh, Everybody boy. saying a 17 and 6 mark was an off year. I guess to put it in perspective, his lifetime record is 60 and 19. And he's already thrown seven pitches to Casey Candell with a count three and two. Well, that's good and bad. As Tim said, when you're doing the, the deep knee bends out on the mound, sometimes you're not loose. So you don't want to go three and two on a guy of diminutive stature and, and take a chance of walking him, even though Candell does not run that well. But this does give you an opportunity to get loose. You'd like to think you'd already done that in the bullpen, but sometimes it's just harder to do. And pitch number eight is fouled away. So it's still three and two with Winningham on deck. And then Tim Raines to follow. No score as the Manson Expos open up a four game series in Montreal. Candell, a tough man to fan. Switch hitter and a consistent switch hitter, hitting 301 from this side and 304 the other way. And Candell draws the walk. So Dwight starts the game by throwing nine pitches to the leadoff man. The Expos are the man at first with nobody out, and Herm Winningham is at the plate. Winningham was one of the four acquired by Montreal in the Gary Carter deal, and that's one of those deals to exercise the cliche that has turned out pretty well for both sides. The Mets certainly happy with Carter, the way Gary's performed. And Montreal winding up the key man of the deal being UB Brooks, who's done a wonderful job for them at shortstop when he's been healthy. And they got Winningham and Floyd Yeoman to the deal, who's on the disabled list right now, and Mike Fitzgerald, the catcher. Four guys on the 24 man roster. I think you might see Winningham bunning here. Normally you wouldn't do that, but managers manage a different type game when Dwight Gooden is pitching. Johnson has shortened up at third. Candell, who has three steals, away to his lead, breaking pitch for a strike. Jackie Moore, who a year ago was managing at Oakland, is the Expo third base coach. I walked out to the batting cage and I said, Herm, are you playing? He said, uh, yes. I said, do you know what your lifetime is off Dwight Gooden? He said, you won what? I said, don't be so positive I said it's you're 0 for 11 with four strikeouts <laughs> he said you mean I never he says I'm due you had to remind him <laughs> Tim Raines is on deck there are a few guys 0 for 11 yes, that's with what well that's exactly four, what her strikeouts he said I'm not the only guy <laughs> I don't want you to tell everybody across the country that I'm the only guy that's 0 and 11 with four strikeouts An interesting 1986 uh, hit 216 on the hole but it much better against left handers and being a left handed hitter only 201 against righties he attributed it to trying to pull trying to hit maybe even though he's a minute of guy trying to hit more home runs this year he's just tried to hit the ball back up the middle he still hit left hander as well and he's hitting much better against right handers he's an outstanding defensive center fielder or really outfielder anywhere they put him liner off the glove of Johnson down to Santana and he goes to Tuffle at second for your routine five six four force. Well, Howard Johnson was playing so far in looking for the possibility of the butt. If you can't catch it it's smart to try to guide it and that's what Johnson does watch shuffle it off to Santana and now over to Tuffle. I think you hit the nail on the head why Winningham Jim is is hitting the ball better because he's trying to hit the ball back through the middle and if he weren't in a position to hit that outside fastball then with that front shoulder closed that's your routine ground ball the second 
a lot of hitters improve on their batting averages by hitting the ball back through the middle and this is one guy that you can say that about in the same breath and another man who's improved on his average and that's no easy feat is at the plate right now Tim Raines who led the league in hitting in 86 very shortly Raines will have enough at bats to qualify and you begin to see his name in the paper and probably up at the top of the list among the batting leaders he comes in batting 367 and the reason he's not already on that list is the fact that he missed all of April he was one of those free agents who were well some would say frozen out and had to re-sign with his old club joined the Expos on the 2nd of May promptly broke back in with a grand slam home run at New York and he's been red hot ever since. One and oh. I asked him about how he was greeted when he came back to Montreal, seeing that he did try to at least make his talents available to 25 other clubs. And he said, maybe those games I had in New York had something to do with my reception. You know, the grand slam, the game winning home run, and the extra innings. He said they were very warm. And this is after a winter, really, of discontent where he did try to go somewhere else. Not maybe as openly as uh, Dawson. Cunningham goes and there is no throw. As he gets a big break. Good delivering to the plate and an easy uncontested steal for Herm. His eighth. Well, the one thing that Dwight Gooden does have is a big wind up at 85. They stole like 45 out of 40, or excuse me, 47. He adjusted, went down instructional to try to work on it. But right here, as you can see, Herm Winningham, he gets a good jump. Carter doesn't even make a throw. When you're one and zero on a hitter like Range, you, you know you have to throw a strike. You take a little bit longer to get rid of the ball. Easy stolen base. Range hits the 2-0 pitch on the ground to second, and Tuffle goes to Hernandez as Winningham advances to third. Montreal now with a runner at third, two gone, and Tim Wallach at the plate. You know, when you look at the Expos, one of the reasons they are doing so well and certainly better than anybody expected, their top of their top six hitters tonight, one through six in the order, five of them are hitting 300 or better, including Wallach at 308. And Winningham's the other, and he's hitting 288. And then you go down to number seven, Law's batting 289. I think when you look at this attack you say well it's not much of an attack because they don't have a whole lot of home run threats they lost Andre Dawson with 20 home runs but if you look at the type of club they have really maybe Wallach along with UB Brooks and because of the the thumb injury last year and the broken wrist this year you really don't know if he's going to hit for power even though he's has hit some home runs the last week or so this is their legitimate home run hitter and a lot of people are scoffing at their ability to score runs and all they do is go out and score runs and score runs. And they're tied with the Mets as far as run production. And they are second only to the Cardinals in team batting average right now with a collective 273. Talking about that roof, they feel that this is a much better hitter's ballpark. Always what you would label a pitcher's ballpark. No more. They think they can reach the fences. It's really certainly changed the ambiance here. It's not as cold as it used to be. They said it makes the day games better because even on a nice day such as today say this was a Sunday afternoon you have the shadows. Guess you could say every night's Halloween here. <laughs> <laughs> Three and one. Le Grand Orange. Huh? <laughs> I guess it's appropriate that the inside of the roof here should be orange because when the Expos were born in 69 the big star was Rusty Staub. Le Grand himself. That's grounded toward the middle and through for a base hit. Winningham scores and Montreal leads one to nothing. And Tim Wallach up among the leaders with 54 RBIs. And this is the first time that Dwight Gooden has been behind since his return. Santana playing in the hole. Rafael Santana, the shortstop, does not have a lot of range and consequently has to play toward the position at third. And he does cheat toward that hole because he doesn't have a real strong arm. Consequently, hits like that can trickle up the middle. So the stolen base by Winningham pays off. It puts him in a position to score as Wallach bounces one through the middle. 
And UB Brooks is the batter, the one-time Met, who missed the last two months of last season, had thumb surgery, comes back healthy this year, and then has his wrist shattered the third day of the season by Danny Darwin on a pitch in a game against Houston and has just come back within the last three weeks. Had a big night Friday night. Brooks was five for five with six RBIs against the Phillies. There's that excellent curveball just missed, and you said behind. You meant obviously score one nothing, the deficit that Gooden now faces. But he has faced five hitters. He's been behind every every one of them. And I went up to Dwight and I said. You know, I read in the papers that you know your fastball is not as good as it was in 85. You had a good curveball. How do you feel you're throwing? He said, I've been behind too many hitters. He's been behind all five tonight. Hit in the air to left center field, and it's Dykstra waving McReynolds away and making the catch to retire the side. But they parlay a steal, an advancement on Reigns' grounder, and Wallach single for a run. Montreal won, and the Mets nothing. Montreal, Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver at Olympic Stadium with the Expos leading the Mets one to nothing going to the top of the second inning and Daryl Strawberry to lead off with McReynolds and Johnson to follow. Daryl Strawberry who has just been through the week that was takes a strike showed up late in Chicago Monday and then late again on Tuesday and that cause Dave Johnson to fine him two hundred fifty dollars and bench him on Wednesday and then the altercation in Pittsburgh and subsequent ejection from the game on Saturday through it all a home run yesterday his 17th of the season to lead the club strike and the count one and two and that's a pitch you see him on an everyday basis that he cannot afford to swing at looks like he handles the ball much better down in the strike zone he chases a high fastball it's going to be a fruitless evening still one and two well that's one of the reasons his average is as high as it is he's batting 277 and also one of the reasons that his home run production is up as Al said with 17 the reason is he has been he's been laying off that pitch inside he's walked 26 times in the last 26 games Still one and two. And I think Daryl is finally realizing that the more he walks, the better he hits. Because when you walk a lot, you're more selective. And that's the biggest difference in Daryl Strawberry this year as compared to years past. It's his selectivity. One two pitch is lined to right field and a right at Candell for the out. One away. And Kevin one of those, McReynolds to the plate. Excuse me, Al. It's one of those pitches. One and two. You try to make a good pitch. You don't, and then you luck out. And uh, Strawberry hit that ball right on the nose, but right at Candell and right. The mistake that he got away with. Kevin McReynolds came over from San Diego during the off season. Match sending among others Kevin Mitchell West. And McReynolds has responded with 10 homers, 29 runs batted in. He's done a more than adequate job in left field. And he's pretty much done what the Mets had hoped and expected. 2-0 the count. And he's a guy who'd love to get a chance to play in the World Series. You'll recall he played on San Diego's pennant winning team in 1984, then had the misfortune in breaking up a double play in game four to fracture his hand. And then put him out of the series. Two and one. I'm talking one of the premier outfielders in the National League last year. 288, 28 home runs, 96 RBIs. It's almost like San Diego took a look at their ball club late in the year and they said, who has the most value? Where can we go to get some young players? They looked at the Mets. They knew the Mets would be trying to improve a world championship club, which is what they did. I think everybody, when this trade was made, said, oh, the Mets are in. And then you have the devastating injuries to their pitchers. The only thing he can't really do is steal bases. 2-2 two -two pitch to Mac Reynolds is hit into right field for a base hit. And the Mets have their first hit of the night. Mac Reynolds is at first base with one gone. 
And it will bring up Howard Johnson, who last year platooned with Ray Knight. Actually, Knight, by virtue of the type of season he had, almost became a, an everyday regular, relegating Johnson to something less than a platoon role. But this year, a whole other story. He's become an Iron Man, Tim. He really has. He has played third base most of the time. And then when Dave Magadan has been given a chance to play, Johnson has moved to short. And Santana has grabbed some pine. However, Santana is batting 315 over the last 26 ball games. And the Mets are a much better ball club with Santana in there. That at least is what Davey Johnson feels. Even though you don't have the offense, even against right-handed pitching, you do have a much more solid defense. Mets brain trust with Johnson, Mel Stottlemyre, Bud Harrelson. One 0 pitch missing away in the count two and oh Johnson already with 11 home runs this season and that eclipsed his mark for all of 86 when he hit 10 his career high would have been 12 with Detroit back in 84 some hitters are adaptable to pitches Howard Johnson is one hitter that almost has the same swing at every pitch change up breaking ball he's vulnerable to the breaking ball but he can turn anybody's fastball around and I mean anybody's they can't throw it hard enough that he can't hit it foul this is a good hitting situation two and oh hits it sharply on a hop down to second and Brooks turns it back to Galarraga not in time Vance Law had to back up on the ball and settles for the force with McReynolds erased and Johnson safe at first Vance Law makes a nice play. Mark 2 0 pitch, the one that Johnson wants. The ball tails away. Law stays right with it. Knows he has the lead runner. He does. And there you see, really not a very good throw from Brooks, but you never know whether Johnson's going to be running hard or not. You assume he will be. Galarraga, who, who is an excellent hitter and also an excellent fielder, makes a nice play just to keep the runner at first. Now Santana hitting a sort of unsantana like 267. Tim talking about what he's meant to the team offensively, and that comes after a poor April. He had a great May. Runner goes, the pitch is a strike, the throw is too late. And Johnson with a steal. And that's 12 for Hojo. This is a stolen base on the pitcher, not the catcher. Jeff Reed, one of the outstanding young catchers with a throwing arm. Dennis just went to sleep. Johnson, who does run fairly well, steals it on the pitcher. Dennis That's just kind of needs to take a no dose to wake you, wake him up. He did that in Baltimore, and I assume he's still doing that. 0-1 is a half swing strike, and Martinez ahead now 0-2. I thought that was a very fair explanation, Jim. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Took the burden off the catcher. Very objective from a former 268 game winner. Well, it's one of those things where you see a good fastball up and away where the catcher is a perfect pitch you want to throw on. You're coming out, you're you're going forward, and the play is not even close. You know that Martinez did not do his job as, as far as holding Howard Johnson close at first. None of the Expo pitchers do, as a matter of fact. They have only thrown out 14 runners, and five of those 14 were thrown out when Jay Tibbs was the pitcher and Jay Tibbs is in the minor leagues now pitching for Indianapolis. One two pitch got him looking so Santana is down on strikes rung up by wire and the Mets are done in the top of the second no runs a hit and a man left on at the end of an inning and a half in Olympic Stadium Expos one bets nothing. This is Corey McFerrin in New York. Update on the Tigers and Blue Jays from Toronto. The story, the American League's top hitter, Detroit's Alan Trammell. Fourth inning, no score, Trammell. Rips one to right field, somehow bounces through Jesse Barfield to the wall. Bill Madlock around to score. Trammell's hitting streak now at 20 games, the longest in the majors of year. 2-0, Tigers in the sixth. In the bottom of the second inning, Montreal on top, one to nothing. Dwight Gooden in the first walked Casey Candell, who was forced by Herm Winningham. Winningham stole second, went to third on Reigns' ground out, and scored on Tim Wallach's base hit. 
And now in the bottom of the second, Andre Scalaraga to lead off. The number six hitter and up among the league leaders taking high. Andres in his second season out of Venezuela after a long minor league stint. You think of him as a young player, but he's already 26 years old. Five homers, 40 RBIs. 2-0 to count. We have the speed gun here tonight, the jugs gun, and Gooden's first pitch of the inning was clocked at 94. And that one's probably up close to the area. 95, we're now told by our producer Ken Wolf, and the count is two and one. Well, I don't, I don't want to undermine his fastball, but that is the faster of the two guns. So he is on the slow gun right around 90, 91, and 95, don't get me wrong, he's getting it up there. But again, behind Galarraga, so now every hitter he's faced, He's been behind, and that is something that he's not happy with. Grounded back through the middle into center field for a base hit. So Andres, who comes in hitting 333, will watch that rise a couple of points. And it will bring up Vance Law. Once you throw the ball, you are become an infielder, and Dwight right there failed to do that. Followed through with it on the fastball, was totally out of position, and the ball that you might be able to deflect, most likely on a curveball. It always seems like, at least when I pitched, you would come a little bit in a better position to field the ball. That was a fastball right up the middle, just a grounder, but nobody's playing there. Vance Law, son of the former great pirate pitcher Vernon Law, hits one to right field and slicing away from Strawberry, but he gets there to make the catch on his way toward the line. As Galarraga gets back to first base. So Law is gone for the first out of the bottom of the second inning. And now Jeff Reed and Tim talked about his defensive prowess, but offensively hitting 133, and he has yet to get a hit at home. He's 0 for 14 in this ballpark. Earlier in the year, Sean Dunstan charged Andy McGaffigan of the Chicago Cubs. Matter of fact, that was one of the big reasons that or the reason that Dwight Gooden was kicked out of the game in Saturday night's game or I should say Daryl Strawberry because he charged the mound it was caused it was called the Dunstan rule as you see the jugs gun there checking out Dwight and Jeff Reed was one of those in the bottom of the pile and consequently was seriously injured in that pile up and was put on the disabled list. So in fairness to Jeff, he hasn't had a chance to get his feet wet in the National League. Reed coming over in the Jeff Reardon deal, which was so maligned here during the offseason. But has turned out pretty well to this point for Montreal because they picked up Neil Heat, who became the National League's first nine game winner on Saturday well, he's giving them about seven solid innings every time out there as we said they've been scoring runs the ERA high threes down to Santana who juggles that may have cost them but it doesn't they still get the double play despite his juggling the ball with Reed's foot speed and he's slow Tuffle able to turn it over and Montreal gone in the second well, you've heard the, of the Jugs gun. Well, here's the Juggles gun, but Santana and Tuffle still make the pivot. And at the end of two, still one to nothing, Montreal. Montreal on top by a score of one nothing as we go to the third. Dwight Gooden was asked what he's learned from the last three months. Is, um, just um, you know, pleasing yourself, not trying to please others, and just do the things that um, you're capable of doing in your own standards. And learning, I learn more about myself and who I am, and the things that I want to do in life, not only baseball. So Dwight Gooden, who rejoined the Mets on the 5th of June and has won his first two outings, leads off at the top of the third and fouls it away in the count on one. Gooden's problem well documented and then the injuries of course to the other Met pitchers as you look at Dennis Martinez which points up an interesting thing in regard to Martinez and that is lack of concentration that crap
graphic illustrating how tough he is against the really good hitters and how many problems he has against the others and that was always the rap on him in Baltimore. Well again uh, if you talk about good and having great ability Dennis has the ability usually to throw four pitches the fastball the curveball the slider and the changeup get them all over used to sidearm guys he's a pretty good fielder works hard um, but occasionally he has those lapses of concentration and again we go back you talked about him winning 15 games in 1981 the year of the strike he was really I think a 14 game winner was the best pitcher in the American League that year yet uh, he does lose it every once in a while out there. Good and lifts it in the air down the line in right field Candell running out of room trying to stay with it and makes the play. Candell has been a busy man. That's already his third put out of the night. Buck Rogers talking about how valuable Casey Candell has been to this club only his fourth start in right field this year. And when you have to watch the wall and the ball it's doubly tough but a fine play by Candell and the ball girl. Yeah that's right. It's triply tough when you have to watch <laughs> the ball girl. Three B's. <laughs> <laughs> Dykstra now grounded out of the first inning. Lynn who shares time with Mookie Wilson and both doing a very good job offensively Dykstra at 300 and Mookie who's on the bench tonight at 310. to the count and there's number one bat in hand waiting for his opportunity long about the eighth inning tonight he figures if in, needed anytime Davey Johnson makes a double switch one of the four outfielders depending on who's starting will be the man who goes into either left center or right field and for that reason Mookie Wilson because of his flexibility probably a more valuable man to the Met now to the Mets now than he was as a regular. Dykstra goes down on strikes and that's number two for Martinez and it's been that sort of night when you're trailing one to nothing a little litter begins to accumulate at the feet of Davy Johnson and Mel Stottlemyre. The sunflower seeds. Looking at Davy Johnson's left knee. Of course, it's been that kind of year after he went 108 games, go all the way to the World Series and win in seven. And really early in the season, but getting late rapidly. You're seven and a half back. Tuffle hits a fly ball to Reigns. And Dennis Martinez has a one, two, three inning as the Mets go silently in the third. And at the end of two and a half, it remains Montreal one, the Mets nothing. We want to remind you tonight following Nightline ABC Sports Monday Sports Night and tonight is the night of the fight in Atlantic City between Jerry Cooney and Michael Spinks and we'll have post fight interviews and a report on that fight for you along with the, an interview with Brian Bosworth who was drafted as you know by the Seattle Seahawks the other day in the NFL supplemental draft and contends he will not play for them. A couple of the features you'll be seeing tonight on Monday Sports Night following Nightline. Bottom of the third inning and Martinez takes a strike. Dennis so many years in the American League so he is not used to swinging a bat in anger as reflected in a 33 for 32 career figure. And reflected on that swing. Only two. Oh yes. <laughs> That's why he enjoyed the American League. He didn't have to fight face a Dwight Gooden. Easily and painlessly. One guy. That's Gooden's first strikeout. Like some of the hitters when uh, <laughs> we had a young outfielder by the name of Tom Chopin. He got three starts one year. He got Nolan Ryan and a no hitter. He got a month later, he got Tiant, and the next month he got Gaylord with all the uh, spit on every ball. And he came back, he said, This is unfair. Three starts in three months. I think Dennis must feel the same way. Casey Candell, strike. Some of you may have read about Candell. 
it's been well noted in several feature stories his mother once played professional baseball in a league in the Midwest in the 1950s he it's a chopper and it's going to be a tough play for Johnson but Howard throws him out Candell can run Johnson having to wait for it to come down and getting off a strong throw to first to nail him on a bang bang play for the second out Howard Johnson as all infielders do try to get on top of the ball when they throw it but sometimes you don't have a chance to do that and that's why he throws it from down there so they play by Johnson gets Candell for the second out and Herm Winningham is the batter And he chops one toward the middle. Tuffle goes out behind the line, the backhand, and then throws high. Tim has him with a good throw, even with winning hand speed. But the Expos keep the inning going. But to me, that's an example of one guy runs a little bit better. You can save nine times. Gold glove saves. Man on second situation. Not a good throw, though. And then again, not an easy play. You have to backpedal the outfield, and you know you have to hurry. But of the two, of the last two respective players, Johnson, really, when, when you consider he had a throw from the side, the ball stayed straight. He made his play, Tuffle didn't. Plus, on the rug, on a play like that, you can't come in and to your right. You've got to go back and to your right to make it doubly difficult. Mm -hmm. Winningham gets an infield single and Reigns is the batter. Reigns grounded out his first time up. One and oh the count. Also not a play you practice a lot in infield practice but remember during the World Series how Ozzie Smith will have the coach hit those high choppers. He'll come in and practice making those plays. It's a, kind of a tough play to duplicate though. Winningham who stole second and that set up a run in the first inning off to his lead at first with a count one and oh on Reigns. So Gooden has to keep an eye on him and drives him back. Winningham with eight steals. Expos have some people who can run range at the plate has 16 steals and he missed a month. Mitch Webster is not in the lineup tonight is 15. This is one of the toughest situations for a pitcher. You, you know the guy on first can run. He's already shown you that earlier in the ball game. And then you have a guy at the plate that's hitting 367. If you cut down on your windup, you might take something off the pitch. So you can pay the price both ways. There he goes. Good jump again. Carter's throw is there, but way too late. And again, Winningham taking advantage of Gooden's delivery in scoring position with two down. Well, credit Gary Carter for not allowing Winningham to dictate what pitch he's going to throw or call for. It was a curveball, a very close pitch. And catchers are trained never to worry more about the guy on first, regardless of the speed, than they do about the guy with the stick in his hand, because he eventually, especially with two outs, is the guy who's going to hurt you. Two balls, no strikes now on Reigns with Wallach on deck. Montreal leading one to nothing. Blocked by Carter. Winningham remains at second, and the count is 3 0. Well, let me ask you a little further. Let's, let's amplify it a little bit further. All right. If you're catching, and you got a guy like Winningham at first, don't you almost know if you throw a breaking ball that he's going to be able to steal? Especially with yeah, a guy but you like don't Good. know whether you don't know whether he's going or not. You can't you can't dictate how you call a game by the speed of the runner at first base, regardless of who he is. If you're going to do that, go ahead and pitch out. If you're going to just throw the fastball, there are a lot of catchers that get caught up in that. They like to come out of the chute and show off their arm, but you can't allow that to happen. He gets the green light three and oh, and why not? He's the batting champion, but all it results in is a fly ball to Strawberry. And the Expos are done in the third. No runs a hit. They strand Winningham at second. After three, it's Montreal one, New York nothing. In Montreal, as we go to the fourth inning, the Mets and the Expos, Montreal on top, one to nothing. Again, the standings in the National League East at the start of play. Cardinals, who have just swept the Cubs over the weekend on top. 
Cubs are six back in second. Montreal third by six and a half. And the Mets come in tonight seven and a half back of St. Louis in fourth place in the East. Keith Hernandez to lead off. Dennis Martinez starts him with a pitch missing away in the count one and all. Hernandez, Carter, and Strawberry in the fourth. Expos a run three hits. And the Mets no runs one hit. that clicking sound is the new sound of the mid 80s that's Gary Carter in the on deck circle with one of those bats where the weight shifts as you swing it in the on deck circle and it creates that that sound perfect <laughs> cue him <laughs> <laughs> two and one account <laughs> <laughs> drive you batty <laughs> literally <laughs> on the count on Hernandez. Gutsy pitch, two and one pitch to a guy that walked 94 times last year. Going to make you throw the ball over the plate. He has a lot of confidence in that uh, that curveball tonight or anytime. Well, I know when you look at the percentages of baseball last year in the National League. When the first guy gets on, he scores 49% of the time. Key batter. Rounded toward the hole and a base hit. So Hernandez is on, and for the first time in the game, the Mets have their leadoff man on. And Gary Carter comes to the plate. ABC's Monday Night Baseball is being brought to you by Michelob Light, who says you can't have it all. Gary Carter, his nine-game hitting streak on the line, grounded out in the first inning. Carter hitting 256. Jim, I guess you can do a lot of things with numbers, but obviously the speed of the runner that gets on first has a lot to do with that. If you have, for instance, a guy like Reigns at first, it may be above 49%. A guy like Hernandez who can't run, it's probably below 49%. Even though you have the heart of the lineup up. Well, of course, that's just an average percentage. Uh huh. But I think that they instill that in your mind over the years. You know, you always have to get the opposing pitcher out. You should always get the first batter out. First pitch. The first pitch is important, being ahead of the hitter. And obviously, if you throw the first pitch for a strike, you will be. Mentally, you almost it's a you have a letdown if the first batter does get on. Now, obviously, you're not going to give up because it happened many times, just about every pitcher to everyone out there. And if it didn't, you didn't pitch very long. <laughs> no balls, two strikes, the count on Carter. Hernandez at first base. Nobody out. Fourth inning, one to nothing, Montreal. You're right in this situation, Car Carter, who's leading the, the Mets in double plays, hit into with 12, is the type of guy that can get you out of the inning, or at least two outs, with one pitch. Martinez throwing a sinker all night. It's a ground ball. Did you see that stat right there? So he has the propensity of hitting the ball on the ground. If he does and it's at somebody, we're going to see most likely a double play. And by the way, by the way, the National League record held by Ernie Lombardi. He grounded into 30 double plays and still made the Hall of Fame. That's right, <laughs> and rightly so mm -hmm. too. The schnoz. Well, that's one of the reasons that uh, we saw Jim Rice cut down a swing up in Boston last year. He took so much criticism two years ago. 36 double play ground up. They, the scouts are talking now with only four home runs, 23 RBIs, that he's cut his swing down so much that it's cost him in the power situation or in the power uh, ability to hit home runs. So Carter of course is not one of these guys. He's going up there and he is not going to cut his swing down. And Carter hits a fly ball to center field where Herm Winningham camps underneath it to make the catch for the first down. Hernandez remains at first. We talked about the trials and tribulations of Darryl Strawberry last week. Here's how Dave Johnson views it. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the issue is over. It's forgotten. Uh, I just don't like to see a young ball player start coming late to the ballpark, and it, it lends me to believe that his off-the-field activities are taking priority to his game time. 
And when that happens, I'm going to do something about it. Uh, and the best way I know to do something about it is not really find a guy, but it's take away playing time. And uh, I hope I got a message to Daryl that he's too important to start having bad habits at this point in his career. He hits a line drive to Brooks, and Hernandez is alert enough not to have strayed too far from first and is able to get back there. So again, Strawberry makes good contact. He hit one on the button in the second inning, but right at Candell and right, and now he lines out. So he is 0 for 2. If you're a runner at first base, the reason you don't get doubled off on a line drive to the left side of the infield is because if the ball does get through, you're only going to second anyway. That's why you have to play the one base at a time type of base running. Now a line drive to the second baseman or the first baseman totally different story because you have third base on your mind not second. McReynolds lines one to center field and Winningham comes up to make the catch and that's that. So Hernandez gets on to lead things off but is stranded at first and after three and a half it's Montreal one the Mets nothing. <laughs> The fans go home unhappy at Wrigley Field this afternoon. This is Corey McFerrin. Lee Smith throws this one away. Wild pitch ninth inning. Glenn Wilson comes home to break up a 2-2 tie. Philly wins it 3-2. Back in Montreal as we go to the bottom of the fourth inning. Tim Wallach to lead off. Then Brooks. And then Galarraga. And that sign letting everybody know they miss Mr. Dawson in Montreal but at least they got range back we talked about it earlier the Reardon trade has turned out to be at least at this point a decent one a better than decent one for Montreal and the Expos are in contention as it's driven to deep right field and Strawberry goes back and can't make the catch as it bounces back for Dykstra and Wallach winds up at second with a double. Tell you the thing about Tim Wallach and Dwight Gooden has had very good success with Wallach coming into this game he was three for 26 but Wallach has a very unusual swing which makes him a low ball hitter. He's a right handed hitter but he has a left hander swing and that he has the loop in the in the swing consequently he's very dangerous on a ball down and away and that's where this ball was and he drives it right above the glove of Strawberry. Daryl full extension trying to act like his compatriot from L.A. Eric Davis. <laughs> what a leaper he is. Who took two home runs away from Jack Clark on successive nights in Cincinnati a couple of weeks back. That's hit through the middle backhanded by Tuffle off balance throw is not nearly in time and rolls into the dugout. And it's two to nothing Montreal. Tuffle will get a throwing error. No run battered in, and it's 2 nothing Expo. Well, Gary Carter is thinking if I back up first base, that leaves home plate unguarded. The way to beat that play is to remind your third baseman with a runner at second that on a ball hit to the right, I'm going to back up the play the third baseman covers home, and that would prevent this type of error. You have to be very alert, however, and anticipate a play like that, especially in a two-out situation. It's no outs here, but in a two-out situation, Carter could have prevented that, but you don't prevent it unless you anticipate it. And Montreal winds up with a run, a man at second, and nobody out, and Andres Galarraga, who's singled in the second inning at the plate, taking a strike on the outside corner. 0-1. We mentioned before Tuffle's been hot with the bat since replacing or not replacing Backman really but in essence playing every day now because of the injury to Backman but he's also made three errors in the six games. All to the count. A difficult error mainly I don't think he should have thrown the ball. Uh, Brooks unselfish hitting hit the ball behind the runner getting him over to third base. Tuffle does not really have a play. I think Hurt Hernandez, as we said, of nine gold gloves. If he thought the ball would stay down, and it did because of the softness around the bases here on the artificial turf, he would have gone out and caught the ball. No chance of getting Brooks, but not really thinking. No chance at all to get him at first base. 
of those situations if you're Dwight Good and you're a little frustrated pretty good pitch to Wallace even though it's a low ball to a low ball hitter. We talked about how the ball carries. I think without the roof that ball is just a normal fly ball or ball that Strawberry hauls in at the warning track. But you have to sometimes pitch with good things happening as the 13 runs he got in Wrigley Field and through the difficult parts. And right now it looks like he is not pitching he's throwing. Two and two the count. With or without the roof the question is what about the baseball this year everybody's saying that it's easier to hit here for a number of reasons. No shadows to worry about and the rest of it and it's a lot warmer but also the, the baseball itself has to come into play this year. I think you said it best when you talked to Keith Hernandez two home runs to center two to left he said that's good for, for a strikeout as we saw an overhand yacker and Galarraga <laughs> gone for good wow. second strikeout. I don't know if he knows it's high but I don't think he gets much of an idea because he gives up look at it. Tell you what, if you're going to get a high pitch in the National League, it's going to be that because it had the wire had plenty of time to watch it all the way into the catcher's glove, as did Galarraga. Well, the ball's certainly carrying better in this park. There have been 53 home runs hit in this park so far this year, and only 98 hit here last year. Law takes outside ball one. That was the second lowest total in the National League. Bush Stadium in St. Louis had 90 home runs hit there. And this is only home game number 29 for Montreal. So they're really not even that close to halfway. It certainly carried yesterday from Mike Schmidt. He had three home runs in Olympic Stadium. The second of which was his 2000th career hit. And then I don't know how many of you noticed he came out of the game. He would have come up again in the ninth inning, but he's just off the disabled list. He had three home runs, and then when his spot came up in the ninth, there was Rick Shue. Of course, Mike already has a four home run game, so what's another, right? <laughs> then at April 17th, 1976, and in that game, the Phillies trailed 13 to 2 with one out and nobody on in the sixth inning. The wind blowing out at Wrigley, and the Phillies ended up winning that game 18 to 16. Schmidt hit the first home run off Rick Russell, and the last home run off Paul Russell, his brother. 2 1 pitch. Foul away. Of course, Tim McCarver knows that because you were, I assume, in that game. I was there. I pitch hit in the tenth inning. I think the score was 17 to 16 at the time. Oh, I thought you were calling the pitches to, when it was 13 to 2. What did you say? No, the fact <laughs> of the matter was I was the 25th guy on the roster. That's why I hit when it was a 17 to 16 ball game. I mean, if you've got to wait to pinch hit in a 17 16 game, you're not going to get many calls. <laughs> But you had to go down to interpret for Carlton in the press That's conference, right. right? That's exactly right. 2-2 two -two pitch is outside, ball three, three and two on law. You mentioned the ball earlier, Al, and I don't know whether the ball's juiced up, but I would think that those opponents of the ball being juiced up, those that believe that it's just a figment of others' imagination, ought to respect the genuinely intelligent baseball people who do think it's juiced up. It's not a handful of people that think that. Players think it. Managers think it. Coaches think it. I'm not try issuing a strong commentary one way or the other. Well, it's a I subject that's come up so often uh -huh. through the years. You've had a tendency to discount it, but you're right. I, I think it's become almost unanimous now. There are very few who play the game or who are around the game on an everyday basis who are disputing it. That's right. to right field and toward the corner and Strawberry gets there and makes the catch for the out and Brooks gets back to second and if Yubi had been more alert that's the perfect play to tag up at second and advance to third but he did of course if he does go into third base that somewhat takes away the curveball from Gooden if you have a man on third with two outs versus a man on second you're a little apt to be able to kind of throw that curveball and relax. It makes a big difference. 
Well, you can't go halfway on a play like that. What you do, you go about a third of the way, about seven or eight strides off of second. And if the outfielder catches the ball, the momentum of his catching the ball is going to carry him toward the wall. That's going to give you a chance to go back, tag up, and walk to third mm -hmm. base. If you're halfway, you're too far to get back and tag up. Mm -hmm. And that's where he was. And so he is still at second with two down. And it brings up Jeff Reed, the catcher. Look at the jugs gun and the readout. I, I assume that says 95. Get a new battery in the gun. <laughs> we might see a uh, pitch around here with Dennis Martinez, the opposing pitcher on deck, already trailing two to nothing. Even though we talked about Reed's inability to hit National League pitching, but oh for his last 15. You have almost a sure out if you make quality pitches on deck. Don't we'll give up another run. Two and all the count on Reed. It's one of those situations you could almost think if you're a pitcher that he's going to go up there and look for the curveball. Of course, the one thing that Gooden really separates him from a lot of other people is both his fastball and curveball, as far as I'm concerned, are equals. You can look for it and still not hit it. Not too many pitchers that I've ever seen in 20 some years, you can say that. And I'm sure Jeff Reed will embellish on that story later on that Dwight Gooden in his prime pitched around him <laughs> <laughs> when he was hitting a dollar twenty five. <laughs> And that's his average right now, folks. 125. Hopefully that not. will not be his highlight <laughs> of his career. Remember when I was hitting 125 in Montreal and he pitched around me. Now Martinez comes to the plate. Montreal on top, 2-0. Martinez struck out in his only appearance tonight. He's 0-3 this season and 3-33. 111 for his career. Al, you mentioned the trade earlier, the Neil Heaton, the two main characters, Neil Heaton for Jeff Reardon. But the Expos got another fine young left-handed pitcher in that deal named Yorkus Perez. He's 19 years old. He's a left-hander, and he's been pitching three years of professional ball. He was 5-1 and one at the Class A competition, and he's just been moved up to Jacksonville. And they are very impressed. It's not too often you get a good young left-handed pitcher. And there's another pretty good young pitcher by the name of Al Cardwell who was involved in that deal as well. You know, Buck Rogers was talking about uh, York has already won a game at double-A level. So he's hoping that maybe in the middle of 1988 he will be here in Montreal. Time will tell, of course. Actually, his name is Al Cardwood. I was thinking of Don. Cardwell. Don Cardwell could hit. Mm -hmm. And he pitched a no-hitter at Wrigley Field in the early 60s. Right. The year escapes me, but as a matter of fact, Don Cardwell was a member of the 1969 Met World Championship mm -hmm. team. Pitching a no-hitter at Wrigley Field. I think Bird Hooten pitched one there as well. Against the team on which I played. Second game of the season in 1972, the Phillies. I was hitless in that game. <laughs> <laughs> One and two the count. How many no hitters have you caught? Two. By? By Rick Wise, who probably ah. had the greatest game. I was there that night, sure. Yeah, 1971. He hit two two run homers and yep. pitched a no hitter. Yep. Taking care of business. Two home runs in a game. Exactly. And then, and then Bill Stoneman up here. It was the first no hitter pitched out of the country mm -hmm. in 1972 against the Mets. One of two no hitters Stoneman pitched in his career. In the air to right field. And a busy inning for Darryl Strawberry. Two put outs and a near catch on Wallach's drive, but Montreal gets a run to pad its lead. It's 2 0, and we'll be back after this message and news headlines from your local station. Two seven game winners dueling at the Astrodome tonight. The Astros, Mike Scott, the Reds, Bill Gullickson here. Scott punches out Tracy Jones' his 8K in five innings. Reds nothing, Astros nothing in the fifth. And 
Other scores, Philadelphia beat Chicago 3-2. Pittsburgh and St. Louis at Bush Stadium 1-1 in the fourth. We just told you about Cincy and Houston. No score at the Astrodome. Here, 2-0 Montreal, fifth inning. And Howard Johnson up there to bunt. Takes low for a ball. In the American League, the Yankees lead Baltimore 6-2 in the sixth. Detroit leading the Blue Jays 2-1. Toronto had its 11-game winning streak snap yesterday. Minnesota leading Milwaukee 4-0 in the fourth inning. Oakland out in front of KC 2-1 in the fifth. The other two games later. Fly ball to left center field. Tim Raines is there to put it away, and Johnson is out number one. One gun here in the fifth inning, and that will bring up Rafael Santana. Funny thing about Santana, here's a guy. He's a shortstop from the Dominican, so you naturally assume he's got a tremendous amount of speed. In his entire career, he has one steal. That's an almost 1,400 at bats. But we, we mentioned earlier how much better the Mets are when he's playing shortstop. They're three and twelve without him at short, and twenty-eight and seventeen when he's in the lineup. Very Davey valuable man. In talking to Davey last year, uh, talking about Davey Johnson, he said, "I said, are there any weaknesses that you think you have in your ball club?" And he said, "Yeah, when I take Santana out late in the game to pinch hit for him, I don't have anybody else to put in, and we're a poor defensive club late in the game. And a lot of times, that's how you're going to win ball games." And I don't see anybody that they have really replaced him with or a utility guy that really can take his place and play as well defensively. And even though he's hitting well, they still keep pinch hitting for him. Two and one to count. Sam Palazzo, right of the screen, the Mets third base coach, last year managing a Tidewater. And that's the route that Davey Johnson took. Water to New York anyway. Davey didn't have to stop at third on the way. <laughs> two and two of the count on Santana. Dennis Martinez, 32. When he came up, a cross seam fastball. The ball took off in the strike zone. Tonight, he took a look at that last pitch. Good sinker. He's gotten behind, but he's been able to make quality pitches. Wallach fields on a hop. Gets him for the out. Two down. And Dwight Gooden will be coming to the plate. So Martinez allowing just two singles. One by McReynolds in the second. The other by Hernandez in the fourth. He has walked one. Struck out two. And all of the parts coming together right now for Buck Rogers and the Montreal Expos. Well, he explained this team. He said, you know, we, this is a team of projects. And Dennis is one of his projects. Uh, he was very disappointed when Dennis chose to be a free agent. As I said earlier, he pitched fairly well at the end of last season, but when he first came over here, I think that might have attributed to the three and six record. He had some shoulder problems when he was with the Orioles and was sent to Rochester for rehab. He wanted him, but they could not come to terms until it really turned out just last week. One and one to count. And Rogers has done a real nice job working with these this group and it had to be a, a tortuous winter for Rogers he watched his front office say goodbye to Dawson say goodbye at least temporarily to Reigns and trade Jeff Reardon and I asked Rogers what his winter was like and he said I didn't sleep very much <laughs> I'll tell you one of the best tributes I've heard about Buck Rogers as a manager came from an extra man Terry Francona of the Cincinnati Reds Gooden grounds one down to Brooks, and he gets him for the out. And we'll find out what Francona had to say when we come back in the bottom of the fifth. Montreal two, and the Mets nothing. Now, if you're wondering how this roof is held in place, that's what it looks like outside Olympic Stadium in Montreal, erected in the early 70s and opened in time to host the 1976 Summer Olympics. The team moved in here in 77 and uh, through the years they kept talking about the roof and it was in storage in France and all of the problems they went through and yada 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 and then finally 
in 1987, some 10 years after the ballpark opens, we've got a dome, but no air conditioning yet. Bottom of the fifth inning is Candell fouls it away in the count one and one. Something I can't understand is the material out of which it's made. To call Kevlar. 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 K E V L A R. Sounds like a, a Greek cookie. <laughs> <laughs> It's made out of the same material that they make bulletproof vests out of. That is, that is strange. I can't figure that out. What's going on? Well, with a lively ball, I guess they oh. planned ahead. Right. A lot of shots hit there. Yes. Yeah. Case Kingman comes back here, right? <laughs> Moon shots. Yeah. Kingman once hit the, the rim at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. That's grounded to the left side and surrounded by Santana, whose high throw is pulled down by Hernandez. One gun, Winningham coming to the plate. And what was it that Francona said about Buck Rogers? Terry Francona, we talk about a credible source because he was an extra man here with Montreal. He didn't play regularly. And when a player goes to another club and doesn't play regularly when he thinks he should have and still says the manager was a good manager, and that's a pretty good source. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, next Monday, Montreal again featured. Some of you will see their game with the Cardinals or Kansas City against Oakland next week on Monday Night Baseball. Winningham fouling it away, and the count is 0 1. Well, UB Brook also, Brooks also talked about what a great job Buck Rogers has done, mainly because he said this is a team of basically role players. So I told Buck, I said, you know, you're getting glowing tributes from your shortstop. And he said, well, I have had to manipulate him. I said, well, that is why you're here. I mean, <laughs> just say, what, what if you couldn't do it? <laughs> I've seen graphics broken down, but Steve Hurd adding a new twist right there. The United States mark and the south of the border mark, or the south of the border and north of the border figures. Well, it all happened back in 84. He came up here, went five for 10. He deked him into trading him up here, and then he only hits in the United States until this year. <laughs> Outside of the count, one and two. He said the best thing that ever happened to him was getting sent out last year. He was beaten out in the spring training of 86, <laughs> as you look at the numbers, by Mitch Webster. But what about the Dominican during winter ball? As it gets by, Johnson goes down the line, and McDonald's will have to track it down. And Herm pulls in at second. And they will rule it a double. Winningham second hit. Winningham had an 11-game hitting streak snap yesterday. He got into the game late, only came up once and was 0 for 1, but he's starting a new streak tonight. Once again, a play dictated by the softness of the dirt here off the artificial turf. Winningham right away. You see Ronnie Hansen waving him in to second base. Makes it easily. We saw the throw from Tuffle earlier. Didn't really figure in the scoring. Well, it did because Wallach scored, but eventually the runner that went to second didn't score. But right there, that's a, that's a very difficult play with two strikes. Johnson's back. He has to come to his right. He figures he'll just play the bounce and doesn't get one into the corner for a double. Tim Raines now who is 0 for 2 comes up hitting 362. Raines hit the ball hard yesterday but wound up going 0 for 5 against the Phillies. So Tim in a little mini slump here. I ask him how he stayed in shape till May 1st till he signed he said I worked out with a high school down in Palmetto I got over 200 swings a day much more than I would have got in spring training but no live pitching did not hit off a live pitcher really until he came up here had a batting cage down there lifted Nautilus and things like that doesn't appear to have hurt him takes a strike at the count one and one I'll say <laughs> Tim, how does Gooden look to you tonight compared to the way he looked a week ago Friday? He looks about right, even though his strikeouts are not up. He had five strikeouts in his first outing and six and two-thirds, ten last Wednesday, and only two tonight. Swing strike and the count one and two. Of course, a lot of that has to do with the lineup that you're facing. The Montreal Expos more of a contact team. Have a, guy, a lot of guys that do not strike out a lot. 
But what you know you could go down the litany of stats were about Dwight Gooden but one of the most shocking things that really stands out it comes glaring at you is that he struck out 10 or more in 32 of 102 ball games including tonight almost a third of the time he's reached double figures in strikeouts that's remarkable and he takes care of Tim Raines here so Raines is now 0 for 3 tonight and 0 for 8 in the last 36 hours strikeout number three for Gooden and it brings up Wallach well this is a curveball he had the first time he pitched this year against the Pirates and as Tim said only five strikeouts I think the most impressive thing about his second start in Wrigley Field is you talked about the 32 times with 10 or more strikeouts. He's done it five times where he's had 10 or more strikeouts and no walks. So he had excellent control. <laughs> now, just to put it in perspective, that's perfect. 32 of 102, and then there was Palmer. I would have thought you that's had more remarkable. than that. Yeah, I would. I would have guessed if somebody 13? said how many times, I would have thought uh, in the 40s probably. Well, no, no, no. I was I not a strikeout too. pitcher. I, I saved. Well, I have two more of those in the playoffs when it counted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that really is remarkable. I mean, here's Gooden, 22 yeah. years old, and has two and a half times as many double-figure strikeout games than you had, and you won 268 games. Well, he may be better than I am. Did you ever take that in consideration? Now, also, I think another thing to look at is that. 90, I think three times I struck out nine guys. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I think you guys are going. We can we can turn statistics any way you want to. You're 90 other th yeah, 93 times I struck out nine batters. Oh, you flirted with 10 yes. quite a bit of time. Oh, quite a few then, times. You know they put you up in graphics if you do that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> two old pitches a strike and the count two and one. It's like winning 20 games, hitting 300. If you strike out 10 or more guys, they expect you to do it every time. I just stopped at nine. And then went to the high rider, had him hit fly balls, and everything was fine. That's Tim, the old Billy Lowe's theory. Tim, the deal was, as you well know, I mean, how many times did Palmer tell Weaver in the eighth inning, come and get me? You know, the older nerve is acting up. Probably with nine strikeouts all the time. Too. <laughs> right. <laughs> Three and one to count on a right. Give the other team a chance. Bring in somebody else. <laughs> you know, I was, a, I was a nice guy. <laughs> if I had had that killer instinct, I would have been much better. <laughs> that and I hadn't torn my rotator cuff when I was 20. <laughs> The amazing thing is that Gooden and, and we talked about a little about this today Tim he has such a graceful motion he uses his whole body tremendous drive with his right leg follows through doesn't throw with an upper body very much like I did wraps his arm a little bit at the end of his delivery but very fluid he's behind a Wallach three and one Winningham at second with two down. And it's hit down the line foul and the count is three and two. I'll tell you Jim and this is an amazing stat given to me by Steve Hurt. You had 13 more times that you reached double figures 13 more than Joe Necro 482 major league appearances mm. and he has never struck out 10 or more batters. It's remarkable. Mm. Never would have guessed that. Joe of course doing real well yeah. with the surprising Minnesota Twins. He's 2 and 0. Minnesota on top of the American League West. The way his knuckleball is fluttering in that dome, he's liable to get his hit one of these days. Maybe. You know, Tom Kelly, the manager of the Twins, all the players said they really looked forward to playing for him. And in talking about Joe Necro, took him out after 6 innings. Brought in uh, Baron Gare. He said his knuckleball wasn't knuckling. Let's get you out of there. You did a nice shot and they win the ball game. Wallach fouls one right off his foot. And it's still three and two. And of all the guys to writhe in agony, this is probably the last one that Buck Rogers would like to see right now. Because Rogers was saying before the game, talking about all of the contributions made by various people, he said the key guy has been Wallach. Well, Tim had a tough year last year. He Let's see he fractures his little toe coming out of spring training then he sprains his wrist to take another look at it. You can see the protection on his left. It really looks like a shin pull hitter a lot of times you turn on that Ooh, ball just pull. there you see it hit the inside of the ankle wow. right where the protection isn't. And then he fractured his left foot at the end of the season. So it's 86 was a tough year. 
you saw the numbers nine home runs 54 RBIs already this year healthy Tim Wallach is an impressive player really one of three guys in the last five years that has averaged 17 home runs over 78 RBIs the other two guys are Mike Schmidt and Dale Murphy good company pretty elite company mm -hmm. tell you a lot of times you can tell what kind of a hitter I know this sounds strange as that ethyl chloride is a is applied and all that does is make it hurt worse. Be interesting so, if he hands the uh, the shin guard to the trainer and says it didn't help you take it. <laughs> <laughs> Slows me down. Nope. Move it over. Yeah, he's going to reposition that thing right now. I was going to say a lot of guys who wear that more than often are low ball hitters because they get a lot of balls down there. They drive them hard and with authority and that's why they have to wear protection on the shins. In the foot area. And also, you talk about you see Buck Rogers talking to him when he broke his ankle, fractured it in September. He played two weeks afterwards until he said, "Oh, well, you know, it still bothered me. Let's go take some X-rays." So he is a gamer. So Rogers coming back to the dugout as Wallach gets ready to stand in again with a count of three and two, and Brooks on deck. Two out. We're in the bottom of the fifth inning. Montreal leading two nothing. Winning hand, the runner at second. And he loses him. So he draws the walk, and Brooks comes to the plate. Newby is one for two. You know, when we saw Buck Rogers, the one thing I think that makes Rogers unique, he wears a watch. He's always worn a watch, and it's a, a habit he picked up or an idiosyncrasy from Bill Rigney, who was his mentor. Remember, Rig always used to wear a watch. And in 1976, when Rig came out of retirement to manage the Giants, the team was a terrible team. They were undergoing a long losing streak, and I said to Rig, hey, just for luck, why don't you take the watch off tonight? And he said, are you kidding? With this team, I never want to miss last call. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. That was the end of Rigney's career the, <laughs> at the end of the 76 season. <laughs> Want to send our best to Rig, by the way, who had some hip surgery recently and recovering out in California. One of the grand gentlemen oh, of this game. Terrific. Terrific. Brooks hits it down the line toward the corner and right field. And it's a fair ball and bouncing away from Strawberry. Winning hand comes in to score. Wallach, Gippy, foot and all comes in to score on a triple by Brooks. Well, somebody's got to be there. Daryl Strawberry cannot be expected to go to the fence and then track it down into right center field. Tim Tuffel, the second baseman, really has nothing else whatsoever to do but to go toward the ball. Timmy doesn't do that, and watch how far Strawberry has to run as a result. Hernandez is the cutoff man, very unusually, as the first baseman, so Tuffel's not used as the cutoff man, but in effect, he should be out there. Ball just inside the line. And very close to being a foul ball. Just there. Another look. And it appeared that it hit in foul territory as we looked at it from that angle. One and one the count. As you would think Daryl Strawber, even though he's running towards the ball, would have had a better view than anybody, and he did not argue. Very close. Probably Hernandez could have had the, the better view because he's not going after the ball. But somebody should be in right center field to track the ball down once it hits the fence. Take another look right now. This is interesting. The ball, to be fair, obviously has to hit to the left of the white line. Might have hit on the line. Yeah, just barely. Might have kissed it, but it doesn't look like it in that angle. Speaking of angles, the angle of that wall dictated that the ball's going to come back toward the second base position. Not being too tough on Timmy, but somebody's got to be there. Mm -hmm. I know one thing, McEnroe would have screamed about that ball. <laughs> one, two, 
pitch is inside and the count two and two on Galarraga. You have Tim Wallach running from first base. Tim Wallach just got plunked on the ankle, so he's not going to get around that quickly, get around the bases that quickly. So if somebody is out there to field the ball, and we think Tuffle is the guy, there could have been a play on him at the plate. Three and two of the count. Brooks winds up getting credit for a two-run triple. Montreal on top, four nothing. Gooden has yielded seven hits. He has walked three, struck out three. And the three two to Galarraga got him looking again. Second time he has struck out looking. And the Expos are gone in the fifth inning, but they add a couple. Lead four nothing as we go to the sixth, and we'll be back after this word from your local station. Another look right now on a play that was very close. Is it foul or is it fair? There was no argument. Looked to me like it disappeared into the white, which would yeah. mean that it hit the white line. Dykstra starts the sixth inning with a soft fly ball to range. One away. And Davey Johnson would have argued because he had a pretty good angle. The Mets dugout is back of third. So he had a pretty clear view of the proceedings in right field. Oh, he probably couldn't believe the ball went that far. Yeah. It was a fastball up and away. Brooks just kind of lunged for it, and he, he can't hit with some power, but the ball went off the top of the wall, or at least the middle of it. One gone in the sixth inning, and Tim Tuffle is the batter. He's walked and flied out. Dennis Martinez. Two hits shut out through five. As Tuffle hits one foul on the count is 0-1. Martinez, remember, allowed only three hits in seven innings against the Pirates the other day. Two in five, so Buck Rogers has to be ecstatic. Well, this is one of the projects he talked about, giving him a chance. As I said, great work ethics, but you have to remember that does have those concentration and lapses. Has not had them tonight. One and one to count. But what he's been able to do a little bit more even though Gooden in the last inning has been able to do it is to get a couple of pitches over almost every Mets hitter he's thrown him enough breaking balls and enough fastballs to establish two pitches only until the last inning is White really had that good curveball and he hasn't had command of his fastball all night so one guy's been able to pitch and the other one has been more of a thrower at least in my opinion mm -hmm. one and two and that man's been doing the throwing really hasn't pitched that poorly been some tough breaks balls hit not that hard but that's part of the game and uh, I don't really think he would if you said to this point are you happy with the way you've pitched tonight you'd say no nice stop at third and he gets him and that's Vance Law who has gone into play third as Wallach had to come out of the game and Tim Tuffle is now hurt of all things appear to be reaching for his hamstring the injury that shelled Wally Backman with whom he had been platooning and the Expos meanwhile with Wally coming out of the game have Law at third and Candell at second and Vance is tested right away a fine play by Law not only did he make a nice play but he got to his feet and, and threw a strike to Galarraga at first base and now Tuffles hurt Backman's on the shelf with a pulled hamstring and now Tim Tuffle appears to be hurt. So two down. And Tuffle heading back toward the clubhouse as Hernandez comes up. And Keith hits it to center. And Whittingham has trouble and drops the ball. Hernandez on his way to second. Here's the throw. It is not in time. Hernandez hitting a pull at the center field. Winningham appeared to have it gauged, and then it sailed on him. And it's an error, a two-base error on Herm. We talked to all outfielders, and they say sometimes, especially for a center field, the ball will hit right at you is the most difficult. 
in knuckles. Winningham, as we said, a fine def 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 defensive center fielder just doesn't make that play. Of course, from up here, you can't tell whether he lost it. Well, the ball was hit hard. It should have been an out. Now Carter comes to the plate. Gary with a nine-game hitting streak, but hitless tonight. He is 0 for 2. We'll get a report on Wallach for you. And also, we'll see about Tuffle. The Expos right now have Law moving to third from second. Candell has come in from second base or from, in from right field to play second. And Mitch Webster is in the game in right. And that means Webster is hitting in the cleanup spot. Two and on the count. Another look. Derek keeps the ball from being a triple, even though Hernandez doesn't run, but it's a ball that he normally catches. The ball was hit awfully hard. It might have taken off, so. But that's why you're out there, and as I said, that's why he usually, the play he's going to make easily. I want to respect the 2 0 changeup. With a four run lead. 4 0 Montreal. We're in the sixth inning. It's a nervy pitch, but when you get it over, it does make Carter have something else to look for. Again, some respect. Carter's the type of guy, though, even though he's been slumping, he does have the, hasn't been hit with that much power, can make the game 4 to 2 with one swing. So the 2 0 fastball is probably the pitch he's looking for. Throw him something else, you get it over, you're going to be that much more effective. High fly ball to left field. Tim Raines with the easy play, and so the error by Winningham does no damage. No runs, no hits, an error, and the man left on. At the end of five and a half at Olympic Stadium, it's Montreal four, and the Mets nothing. Back in Montreal, Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver, another look at Herm Winningham. He's had a bad night. That's the third error he's made. Yeah, error he's made on the same ball. <laughs> and we thank you for the. Uh, I guess they didn't have enough room for Palmer's name. No, they just. Craig Janoff saying that's your on camera for the night, Jim. <laughs> It's only a queen size sheet. That was the problem. <laughs> Bottom of the sixth inning. Vance Law to lead things off. Being a big guy, I can only relate to king size bets, Al. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I had figured you would. Grounded to <laughs> short. Santana throws out Law. Meanwhile, at second base, Billy Alman has taken over for the Mets, and so we'll check on Tim Tuffalo had to leave the game. Alman recently picked up from Pittsburgh, and there he is. One gone, Jeff Reed is the batter. Detroit beats Toronto 2-1, to one, second loss in a row for the Blue Jays, Terrell over Key. Reed at the plate, strike. I knew we were in trouble when Palmer referred to, was it Winningham as diminutive? I mean, is 5'11 diminutive, Tim? <laughs> but he plays smaller. We don't understand that. <laughs> when you were down in the trenches, as was I, before the game, uh -huh. he looked about 5'9. Uh -huh. Your size. Fouled away. <laughs> well, and the you count know. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll tell you, from from the way you pitched, I would imagine that perspective made a lot of hitters look smaller than they really were because you were a, a stand-up type of pitcher, as opposed to a guy like Dwight Gooden who uses his back leg. And a guy who's in this ballpark tonight who used his back leg better than anybody, and that's mm -hmm. Tom Seaver. Sure. One ball, two strikes to count. By the way, with, with Seaver, 
are the Mets still thinking about having Tom in the rotation or at least getting a start by the end of the month? As a matter of fact, Rick Aguilera, who is on the disabled list, and Tom will have a simulated game at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. Tom went down to Tidewater. He started the exhibition game on Thursday. He worked two and a third innings and gave up seven runs, and he was genuinely embarrassed. Davey Johnson said it's no big deal. Get your work in, throw 60 or 70 pitches. But Tom was genuinely upset about that. There's number 41. At age 42. Has to wear those comfortable shoes. When you get along a little bit long in the tooth, you know. <laughs> two and two the count. But really, when you talk about Tom, you and Tom, both right-handed, both great right-handed pitchers, Jim, seriously. But two different pitchers in that you were straight up more and Tom dragging that right leg. Well that's why he's been able to pitch as long as he has been as effectively as he's been able to and also stay away from shoulder and really elbow problems because he does have the perfect compact delivery using the total body. Dwight Gooden very much like that for a tall guy. I mean Gooden a Seaver is what about six feet six one Gooden almost six four. So you maybe he uses his leverage a little bit more but he does have a lot of thrust from his right leg when he pushes off. I think it's I think it's interesting the influence that Tom Seaver had on that whole staff back in 1968 and 9 and 70. Reed takes a call third strike and so Jeff goes down. Gooden has his fourth strikeout. And another look at Tom. You saw a whole bunch of Seaver clones coming up. Craig Swan is the first guy who comes to mind for me. Of course, Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan, of course, and obviously still pitching, the all-time strikeout leader. Jerry Kuzman pitched till he was 42. Mm -hmm. Tug McGraw pitched till he was 39. And I would think that a lot of the pitchers that pitched on the staff with the Orioles more or less emulated you, Jim. I I like to I mean, think they did, but I don't think from a style point. Uh, it just seemed, if you look at the Mets from that from that ilk, Rube Walker, who was a catcher, who was yeah, a pitching coach, yeah. it's almost like he said, "Okay, all the Mets pitchers are going to throw this way," and I think that's why you've seen Ryan be able to pitch really to 40 years of age and be able to throw with a velocity. The one thing that impressed me about Tom Seaver last year is he still has good velocity. He can give you six or seven innings. Whether he'll be able to do that this year is another thing. Accelerated spring training. Only through maybe for the last three weeks. Tough. Martinez takes a call, third strike. And so Dwight Gooden has his first one, two, three inning. It comes in the sixth, and we go to the seventh with Montreal leading the Mets for nothing. We're back in Montreal, Jim Palmer spent his whole career in the American League, so he never pitched here. Did you realize, though, Jim, that Tim McCarver played here and not only played here, if I am not mistaken, didn't you play about six or seven games at third base for the Expos in I, 1972? I most certainly did, and about six or seven in left field. And that project was was uh, Gene Mock was the manager, as a matter of fact, and that project didn't last long. Is that where his nickname, Little Genius, came from? <laughs> with or without <laughs> with, with or without the catcher's proof? That proved Just. that the little, he was not a little genius during that period, putting me at third base. Jimmy, I always wondered about one thing. Everybody said, you know, you had such a great influence and, and working relationship with Carlton, and yet you were traded in the middle of that incredible Carlton right. season when he won 27. Actually, he was one game under 500 when I was traded. He was six and seven, and John Bateman caught the majority of his games, and Lefty won 15 in a row that year. Mm -hmm. Wound up winning 27 games for a team that won a total of 59. Seventh inning, Strawberry has flied out and lined out. He's hit the ball hard twice, but for naught. He'll be followed by McReynolds and Johnson. It's 4 0 Montreal. I'm trying to remember back, it was it had to be John Baccabella who John, was the catcher for Montreal it. at the time. Over at Park Jari. Park Jari. That's the way the PA announcer used to announce Baccabella coming to the play. John Baccabella. And who was it Terry Humphrey? Yes. Was the other catcher? Uh-huh. Mike Marshall in relief. Down the line in left field and out of play. Was Coco LeBoy on the team at that time? No, he wasn't. I played with the Cardinals in the minor leagues with Coco. Actually, not in the minor leagues in spring training. 
but Coco was a drafted player by the expansion Expos in 1969. Some of the great names in the Expo oh, past. Wonder. Mac Jones, mm -hmm. Jim Mudcat Grant was their first ever opening day pitcher. And Darryl Strawberry gets rung up. Strikeout number three from Martinez. The report, meanwhile, on Tim Tuffle's strained left hamstring. That's why he's out of the game. They've already lost one second baseman. Wally Backman with a strained hamstring, so they have to be fairly disappointed. Tuffle, as we've seen tonight, often maligned for his defensive liabilities. You talked about maybe not really. I doubt if he knows, even though he's been playing for four or five years, that he maybe should go down the right field line. That's hit by Law and down the line in left field. Reigns over to cut it off, and McReynolds is on his way to second, and Kevin in there with a double. And that's the first extra base hit off Martina. So McReynolds a double with one gone in the seventh inning and Johnson will be the batter. Martinez tries to come inside on McReynolds. That's where the National League tries to pitch Kevin. And Kevin's so strong he just fists it to left field and would have had a double had Tim Raines not bobbled that ball. Now Johnson is 0 for 2. As he climbs in, batting 245. Funny, thinking about Seaver, and we were talking about the Expos, it points up how long Tom has been around. The Expos are in their 19th season now. They were born in 69. The first ever game for Montreal was in Shea Stadium in New York on April 8th, 69, and the pitcher, Tom Seaver. And the first pitch in an Expo game in history with Seaver delivering to Maury Wills. Oh and two who was traded that year along with Manny Mota for Ron Fairley and I believe Bob Bailey both coming to the Expos. I played in the first game in this ballpark and Dow Maxville hit his only only Grand slam home run to right center field at Park Jardy. Mm. A game in which the Cardinals lost eight to seven. Park Jardy. Dow Maxwell now, of course, the general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. That's grounded foul. Funny, they won their, their home opener 8 7, and they won that game at Shea Stadium 11 to 10. Grant started, but he was gone by the second, and Seaver was gone early. Final score in New York tonight. The Yankees beat Baltimore nine to two, and Tommy John, at the age of 44, is now seven and two. And with Toronto losing, the Yankees are now two back. Zero oh and two on Johnson. One and two now. Four runs, seven hits, and an error for Montreal. 0-3 and 1 for New York. And activity in the Mets bullpen now. With Jeff Innes throwing. He worked yesterday briefly in Pittsburgh. Popped out of play. One and two. Gooden and Stottlemyre. And it's been, well, you'd have to say the weakest of his three outings so far. Oh, it's been a somewhat disappointing night, but if you go back and look at his other two games, he's always handled Pittsburgh well, and the Cubs are a free swinging type of ball club, which. I know it is somewhat of I know I didn't strike out 10 guys that often but I <laughs> kind of consider myself a power pitcher you like the kind of team that comes up uh, similar to Toronto's ball club that comes up and aggressively goes up as you said this is a much different team contact you're not going to strike out that much They put the ball in play and they hit the ball all over the ballpark. I think one of the adjustments the National League made last year as opposed to 1985 is they started laying off the high fastball from Gooden. That added to his being 17 and 6. 
And also tonight, he wasn't even close. I mean, no. In other words, he wasn't around the belt. He was up at the letters, which is a ball all the time. Johnson loops it down the line, hooking foul. And still a ball and two strikes on Howard with Santana on deck. I think you pointed it out early, Jim, that Dwight was falling behind the hitters. And when a pitcher falls behind the hitters, he can't expect hitters to swing at the high fastball. Only when the hitter is behind in the count and in a defensive posture, is he going to go for the high fastball? Well, above a perfect example right here with Howard Johnson, Dennis Martinez. He, the first times he got him out with fastballs, here he's trying his whole rep repertoire. He is trying to get him to swing at a ball. Does not want to throw the ball within the strike zone if he doesn't have to. And at one and two, he's nibbling. Let's see if he's able to do that. Half swing, he commits, and he gets tagged by Reed. Well, he was able to, uh, yeah, he was able to accomplish it. And again, if, if the count is two and one, most likely he takes that pitch. See yourself from another angle, right there. Does he go across? Well, way, way, way across the front of home plate. And Dennis Martinez established his curveball early here in the seventh. He's still using it. Anybody need a pitching coach? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's also said that if you don't notice a catcher back there. That he's doing a good job, and Jeff Reed should be given a lot of credit. Santana grounds one foul, and we can tell you that ABC's Monday Night Baseball is being brought to you by Coors Light, the Silver Bullet. There's no slowing down with this Silver Bullet. Two out, McReynolds at second base. 0 and 1 the count on Santana. With the pitcher spot due up next, and Mazzilli already out of the on deck circle. Oh, that was two. A perfect illustration, Tim, of Jeff Reed. Calls for the fastball sitting in the middle of the plate, just kind of slides to the outside corner, gives the home plate umpire a great look, receives it right on the corner as you look at Lee Mazzilli, who will most likely hit next if he has a chance to, with two out here in the seventh. And if he doesn't get to hit, Gooden will probably go one more inning. By no means maligning the offense so far of Jeff Reed, but when you're hitting a dollar and a quarter and still in the big leagues, you have to be a good catcher. And I think he's showing tonight that he does move around very well. Great pitch selection, the hidden game. And he caught Dennis the last time he pitched, so he's pitched twice and he's had Reed both times. And Santana got on strikes, and so Dennis Martinez strikes out the side. He had struck out two through six, and he strikes the side out here in the top of the seventh inning, and that, for the moment anyway, keeps Dwight Gooden in the game for another inning. At the end of six and a half, four nothing Montreal. And so following night line, it's ABC Monday Sports Night. And a reminder that coming up this weekend, the U.S. Open Golf Championship from the fabled Olympic Club in San Francisco. Saturday, third round coverage at 2.30 Eastern Time. The U.S. Open this weekend on ABC. We go to the bottom of the seventh inning, Casey Candell to lead things off. Candell over two plus a walk. Lifts it in the air to shallow left field. Santana telling McReynolds he'll handle it. And he ain't lying. One away. One pitch, one out. Winningham will be the batter. And we can update some scores for you. Phillies beat the Cubs 3-2. to two. If Montreal wins, by the way, they'll move into second place. Pittsburgh and the Cardinals 1-1 one, one in the seventh. Houston leading Cincinnati one nothing in the seventh inning Mike Scott has 13 strikeouts in the American the Yankees beat Baltimore Tigers knocked off the Jays Minnesota leading Milwaukee five to nothing in the eighth inning Oakland leading Kansas City five four and Mark McGuire is at his 21st home run of the year for the A's and the other games underway shortly. Winningham takes outside ball one. One and other count. 
0 for 11 2 for 3 tonight he's hot as he said he's due and the other one was a deflected shot but Howard Johnson was probably the hardest hit ball of right, more so than two base hits an example excuse me Al the uh, Scott with the what 12 13 strikeouts against Cincinnati I mean is Cincinnati becoming another big red machine great offensive ball club team that I faced in the 70 World Series that basically not much pitching but you can certainly score some runs in a very aggressive hitting ball club so if you're going to strike guys out it's nice to have guys going up there not taking a lot aggressive hitters it's not the case here Montreal very selective Bobby Winkle is trying to get them all to hit ball back up the middle even the home run hitter Tim Wallach two balls and a strike the count Ball three and the count now three and one. Reds are becoming a, a big red machine offensively as you say. Pitching wise though it's a whole other story in Cincinnati right now. With Soto on the DL and Browning going down. And Jerry Royce was released. Right. Oh and five. Ron Robinson has moved into the starting rotation and Bill Landrum was recalled. What a fine young arm he has. But when you think about it, with the exception of Houston and possibly Los Angeles, everybody in the National League is looking for a starting pitcher. Right. Where are they? Yes. In the Mets case, obviously, they're injured, most of them. John Tudor's out for the Cardinals. It's funny, in addition to hearing so much about the juiced up baseball this year, the other thing you're beginning to hear a lot is about the quality of pitching diminished to the point where a lot of people are saying they can't remember top to bottom in a general sense the pitching being this week and he's picked them off at first base. So Herm Winningham was straying trying to get back and Gooden throwing over there and Winningham has stolen two bases tonight had designs on the third but Gooden nabs him this time. That's really that balk move. He, he appeared to be in there. It looked like his hand was in there. But what Gooden does is he leans on the left leg. That's the old Dodger balk move. Yeah, what the runner by... usually yeah, he looks for is the heel or the shoulder. Uh huh. A guy named Davey Leonard who had one of the best balk moves. In, in fact, he used to bring him in. Earl Weaver bring him in just to pick guys off. He never had a pitch to anybody. What he does is you try to put your weight on your left side, lift your heel with your weight on your toe. Lean your front shoulder towards home plate and wheel to fire to first. Now, if the umpire will let you do it, it's fine. Now, there have been more box called the National League this year than any year in recent history, and the same in the American League. Box Char are up 61% in the National League alone. Charlie Huff, I mean, long of tooth, said he had three call the other a night from not hesitating. And we talk about that from the stretch situation. You have to pause for a second before you go to home plate. Well, they're calling. He had three the other night. He said they haven't weren't a balk 15 years ago, but they were tonight. Talked to umpires. They said, no, we're just, uh, they're balking more. We're not calling any. I mean, we're calling more, but we're not trying to be any more stringent with it in enforcing the rules. But again, that's something you have to do. If you're Dwight Gooden and you're tall and it takes a long time to get rid of the ball, you have to try to do something to deceive the runner. He was able to do it there, even though it did look like Herm Wimmingham did get back to first save. Two and one to count. Tim Raines hitless tonight, hitless yesterday. 0 for 8 in his last two appearances. So scuffing the ball is cheating, but deceiving the runner at first is not cheating. Only if you get caught, then they oh. call a ball. <laughs> See, scuffing the ball is illegal too, Tim, as I know you know. But of course, if you can get away with it, it isn't. I mean, how do you think Mike Scott struck out 13 tonight? To well, be he, honest. He's added. Now it's 14. He's added one. 14 now. We'll keep talking, which no doubt we will. <laughs> he might get <laughs> many, many more. Well, he's not the only one in the National League to do it either. Three and two to count on Tim Raines. I mean, they're even accusing Nolan Ryan because he's come up with a, a, a really a 
with the seam fastball to go along with that riser he's thrown for the last seems like 20 years and they're accusing him of turning the ball over scuffing it cheating whatever he's doing it's working he struck out 11 the other night against the Dodgers we were talking about striking out 10 or more that's 167 times for Ryan and still 13 for Palmer <laughs> and Reigns is gone. So Tim 0 for 4 tonight That's six strikeouts for Gooden. His night is over. They'll pinch hit for him in the eighth with Montreal on top. Four to nothing. Start the eighth inning. Dave Magadan batting for Dwight Wood, leading things off against Dennis Martinez. And the count is one ball and one strike. Magadan, rookie third baseman, will be followed by Dykstra and Alvin. Dennis Martinez working on a shutout. Good fastball. Martinez, remember, struck the side out in the seventh inning, and he's ahead here one and two on. Magadan. Well, Dwight Gooden will bring the best out in you if you have it, and he, Dennis does have it. An interesting story from uh, Frank Cashin, who's now the executive vice president and general manager of the Mets, was how when he ran the Orioles, how they signed Dennis. Magadan drives one to the gap in right center, but moving over is Webster to make the catch. One gone. Going back to that story, take a look at. Keith Hernandez. I don't know if he's talking about the great pickoff move that picked off Herm Winningham or he's talking about Dwight really didn't pitch that poorly other than that ball down the right field line and gesturing over his shoulder which wasn't really hit that hard but it's a team game not vintage good but a good performance. Anyway going back to that story Dennis is from Granada down in Nicaragua and they wanted to sign him. They had heard about a youngster that had a great arm. He had a curveball and a fastball at that time, and they had a Frank used to work for a brewery in Baltimore, and they had a brewmaster who was from Cuba who loved baseball. They got him to go down to Nicaragua to be the interpreter, and the Orioles end up signing them. And he turned in. Some fine seasons in Baltimore and the National League since coming over his only complete game was last August at Pittsburgh and interestingly it was a shutout trying to duplicate the feet tonight one and two now well, I talked earlier about the alcohol problems and, and seeing him over the winter in Baltimore he seems to have battled those successfully of course I think he also understands that will be something he's always going to have to battle but the one thing and we talked about this in New York the first couple games Al is that to really have a good patch pitching staff Tommy John talked about Tom Seaver what an older pitcher or even a, a starting pitcher wants to do is give club quality innings and one thing Dennis Martinez can do if he's healthy and certainly appears tonight is go out there pitch every fourth or fifth day depending when you give him the ball and give you six to eight good innings can't say that about too many pitchers nowadays. Foul at the plate. And with Montreal's bullpen, that's all you're looking for. If you can get a guy going out there giving you six or so. They've got Tim Burke, who's really come on. They've got Andy McGaffigan, who's done a nice job for them. They've got Bob McClure setting people up and also coming in to get left-handers out. They've been spotting him. They've just called up, recalled Jeff Parrott. Martinez, meanwhile, trying to become the first to pitch a complete game shutout against the Mets this season. They've been shut out overall three times in combined efforts. And Dykes for fouls it away. So Buck Rogers has to be pretty happy with the way things are going with his pitching staff right now. Well, complete games are things of the past. The Expos only have four complete games this year. And I think a lot of managers from a modern day standpoint saw the success that Whitey Herzog had in 1985 with not one stopper. I mean the Cardinals lost Bruce Souter and then he had the bullpen by committee and I think a lot of teams are emulating Herzog now. That's grounded foul and it's still two and two. Because what you do with the bull, bullpen by committee you make the opposing manager use players by left and righting him. Even though the Expos have only one left-hander, 
there are a lot of teams that are bulking up their bullpen with two left-handers and two right-handers. And by doing that, you manipulate the lineup. That's one of the big reasons that complete games are things of the past. It's one major reason why the Toronto Blue Jays are having as much success as they are this season as Dykstra goes down on strikes and flings his bat away in disgust. And that's six strikeouts for Dennis Martinez. Bill Almond will be coming to the plate. Well, just when you're supposed to be tiring, the curveball's getting tighter. Looks like he still has awfully good velocity with his fastball. And that's not a pitch that Dykstra hasn't seen. He's thrown that pitch to him all night long. So if you do get a little bit tire, tighter and the, the tighter and the ball does not have that tight spin, well, he's probably looking for it, but they're still not able to hit it. Oh, and on the count. Man has had his problems on the left. Ron Darling with just two victories at this point. Dykstra still angry and frustrated. Rounded wide a third. Backhanded by Law. Long throw. Nice stretch by Galarraga for the out. And Martinez three outs away now from a shutout. It's still four to nothing Montreal after seven and a half and we'll return to Olympic Stadium after this word from your local station. A lot of cases uh, or a lot of instances that's what happened with this ball club. I think uh, everybody told us we were bad for so long that uh, we just went out and everybody on this club has has busted their tail to, to be good. And right now they're almost good enough to be in second place in the National League East and that's where they will reside when this one is over if they hold on because Chicago has lost the Cubs would drop to third and we'll get an update for you on the Cardinals who were tied with Pittsburgh and now the Pirates have taken the lead in that game 3 1 Pittsburgh in the eighth inning. So Montreal could not only wind up in second place, but move to within five and a half. Jeff Innes, who's been a relief pitcher through his professional career, he's a rookie. He made a start, though. The Mets were in such dire straits for starting pitching that he had to make a start on May the 25th in San Francisco after 191 consecutive relief appearances since he broke into pro ball in 1983 and he faces Mitch Webster who came on in the lineup when Tim Wallach was removed because of that foul ball that Wallach took off his ankle back in the fifth. And it's one of those that works out of the stretch even with nobody on base and the count 0 and 2. Got to like Webster hard nosed player the type of guy that you figure he, he takes his uniform off goes in and showers. No deodorant zones. Baraxo just kind of puts it all over his body. I mean, doesn't say much. You try to talk to him. I mean, he doesn't want to. He just wants to play. He didn't play tonight because he's a switch hitter that's kind of been in a slump. So Buck Rogers gives him a night off, puts in a guy that's 0 for 11 in Winningham, gets what, two or three hits? I mean, no wonder he's they're playing so well. I'll tell you, if he's using Baraxo, I'm glad I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine what Gary Carter's going through now. Baraxo. Oh, Baraxo. I don't I love know it. why. I love it. He fouls it away. Well, we talked last week about uh, how Toronto has really gone in in this major league draft, and they've gone. I mean, George Bell about hit about seven home runs last week for twenty-five thousand. Here's a guy that got here to Montreal because of that same draft. Back in '85, they had Manny Lee and Louis uh, Thornton. They couldn't use him. They sent him back to the minors, and Montreal got him in a trade, and he really played well for him. Playing right field where Andre uh, Dawson played last year, good defensive outfielder, beat Winningham out for the job in center field, so he can do a lot of things for you, and he's a switch hitter. 36 stolen bases. Led the National League in triples last year with 13. He's a good player. He's a guy who was drafted originally by the Dodgers way back in 77, and then he, he wallowed in that Toronto system. That's a tough outfield to break in with. When you had Bell and, and Mosby and Barfield. Remember, he was playing in the minors behind those guys as they were coming up. Or in the case of Bell, after Bell had been plucked in the minor league draft in Philadelphia. Fouled away, and it's still one ball and two strikes account. 
course the rule is that if you do take a player in that major league draft it used to be twenty five thousand now it's fifty he has to stay with your major league clubs count as one of the twenty four men so a lot of times you get such a great steal that you take that risk and that's what they did in eighty five and Mitch Webster came over here to Montreal as you see him take strike three. So one gun after that build up after yeah, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Mitch. Well, this is why he didn't play tonight. Buck Rogers said if we see I mean a nice breaking ball from Ennis. He just said he has not been seeing the ball well from the left side so give him a night off and the only reason he's really playing because of the injury to Tim Waller. One gun and UB Brooks is the batter. Again Brooks has been back in the lineup now only about three weeks. And he's hitting 319 strike. And here's a guy who didn't play at all in August and September. Then the offseason. He gets a little over a month in spring training and then broke his wrist on the Danny Darwin pitch. So Yubi has played very sparingly, but hasn't lost that stroke as he throws one into left center, up the gap, off the wall. And as Dykstra gets it back in, Brooks winds up at second, and he has a single, a double, and a triple tonight. Well, a hanging breaking ball that stays inside. And Hubie Brooks, even with all of the hand problems that he's had with the broken right wrist earlier this year, the operation and the really nasty-looking left thumb, he's got a button in it, he's got a scar, it goes from the tip of the thumb down to the base. 30 stitches in it. He still has strong hands. He is one of the real quality offensive producers in the National League. Mm -hmm. two, two years ago, for instance, he had 100 RBIs. He got his 100 on a home run off Ron Darling at Chase Stadium. And that year, 40% of his RBIs were with two outs. And tonight, the triple came with two outs to drive in two runs. He's doubly dangerous with a couple outs. Tough in the clutch and a guy who couldn't win a batting title. Remember last year he was hitting 340 when he had to go on the DL. So he'd had a shot at it. Galarraga takes outside ball one. You know we were talking about Reed before what he does defensively. And I think it points up the strength of this. Montreal lineup at least one through seven in that you can afford to have a read in the lineup and it goes back to what we talked about earlier tonight they were able to start five men including Galarraga hitting better than 300 and two others in the 280 category well Galarraga is another one of those guys that an injury has really helped him last year at about 270 10 home runs he's, he's hurt his right hand Johnson to Hernandez for the out Brooks remains at second and Vance Law will be the batter. So with a bad hand he cuts down on his swing. He's coming into the game hitting over 330. Not hitting the long ball but he is hitting the ball back up the middle. Good defensive player. Last year he struck out 79 times I think in 320 or yeah 320 times at bat. I mean over a third of the time. Not exactly the best way to go about hitting. Minnesota keeps on rolling. How about Fly living. Not only a shutout, but that means he didn't give up a home run tonight. After what is it, 20 consecutive starts in which yep. he had given up at least one homer? And he gave up 50 last year. Major league record. I wonder if he's disappointed. I wouldn't imagine. No. So he's home, Fly Levin. <laughs> with a shutout. That's Eastern time. <laughs> With apologies to Chris Berman. <laughs> Law half swing strike. Berman's greatest though is the San Diego. John, outfielder. I am not a crook. <laughs> one and one. He wasn't much of a crook last week. I think he was like one to thirteen. In there for a strike in the count one and two. You talk about a young man who never gets cheated. Not Jeff Ennis, but John Crook. He has three healthy cuts every time he's up there. The fine left fielder, first baseman for the San Diego Padres. 
inside the law two and two final score now Pittsburgh has defeated St. Louis three to one. I beg your pardon. That is being amended now by Ken Wolf. Strike that from the record. It's 3 1 Pittsburgh, bottom of the eighth. Hernandez is there to make the catch in foul territory. And Montreal is done here in the bottom of the eighth inning. No runs to hit. The man left on to the ninth. We go. Montreal four. And the Mets nothing. National League East leading St. Louis cool off by last place Pittsburgh tonight in the eighth inning. Mike Diaz against Pat Perry and Diaz crunches it right here. Heading for the seats in left field for Diaz's 10th home run of the year. Gives the Bucks a 3-1 lead. Cards four game winning streak in jeopardy. Back to Montreal. And here at Olympic Stadium it's Keith Hernandez to lead things off in the top of the ninth inning. Montreal on top by a score of four nothing as Hernandez takes a strike. Keith one for three hitting 308. It looks like Keith has an idea about growing that mustache back does it not. I asked him about that before the game he shaved it off last week at two home runs in a game in Chicago. He grounds it foul outside first. He just said, hey, look, my beard grows quickly. I can grow it back in just a couple of days. Connecticut loves the Mets and Keith's mustache as well. But uh, he's gained strength from <laughs> shaving it off with three home runs in his new state. The reversal of the Samson Delilah story. Yeah, right. <laughs> One and two, they appeal, don't get the call. One ball, two strikes to count. Well, that's how you hit 300 every year. 0 oh and two, you can check your swing. I mean, that's a good breaking ball. Most hitters would commit themselves. Holds up, and gives himself another chance. But the only time you will ever see him expand the strike zone is with two strikes. It's not that high. By expanding the strike zone, of course, you mean that he's looking away, which means that he's vulnerable inside. I think a lot of little league pitchers grow up thinking that the only time that a good curveball should be thrown is with two strikes. If you flip flop, flip flop that thinking, usually it's correct because the good hitters like Hernandez, when they look away, they're vulnerable inside, which means that that's the time you can jam them, and the curveball's an easier pitch to hit. Of course, that's only if you're disciplined. I mean, you're looking at one of the most disciplined hitters that I've ever seen. I, the only pitch I've ever, even when I pitched to him, was a changeup. That's right there. He just he worked Dennis Martinez for a walk. He got him to do exactly what Dennis didn't want to do with a four nothing lead, especially leading off the ninth inning. That's the first walk that Martinez has yielded since the second batter of the game when he walked Tuffle. And that means McClure and Burke will get up. Bob McClure is the left-hander, and Burke is their closer. In the Montreal pen. You know what a tough decision uh, is 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 a, a situation like this four run lead a guy that's pitched very well to the eighth inning or through the eighth inning and you have two relievers and we saw McClure and Burke they'd like to come in before the game gets really deep into having them in a pressure situation and then you have Buck Rogers who would like to see Martinez save the bullpen get out with a, a shutout so tough situation. Carter drives one to deep center field and going all the way back is wanting him to make the catch up against the fence to the deepest part of the ballpark. And it's a tough way for Gary Carter's nine game hitting streak to go down the drain. Well, the one thing Winningham did, he realized that the ball was high enough. The fence isn't going to move, so you've got to find the fence first. And that's what he does. He goes back to the fence. And then jumps. You don't, this is not a timing play to the fence, and now he jumps. That's what that warning track's there for. Three and a half steps, and then he jumped. Good play by Winningham. He's had an active night. 
And Carter's had a frustrating one. Strawberry, he too is at a frustrating night. He's hit the ball sharply twice and struck out. He's 0 for 3. Line to right, line to short, and went down on strikes. Two and all the count. Well, Genesis pitched him. He threw him a breaking ball. He hit a rocket to right for an out. Then he threw him a fastball away. He lined out to short. Take a look at Buck Rogers. There's ever ever a time to challenge. It's right now, right, Jim? A walk. Well, you just, the, the situation is that you'd like to have a shutout, but you don't want to put additional runners on. So here's two and zero. My best fastball down the middle. See if you can hit it. And it ran low. Instead, he's three and zero with McReynolds waiting on deck. And again, Dennis most likely has not pitched nine innings or into the ninth inning all this season. So a lot of times. He knows what to do. He's been out there enough. He just can't do it. And Strawberry is on. And so Rogers, looking over toward Larry Bernard, the pitching coach, has watched Martinez walk two here in the ninth inning, and McReynolds coming to the plate. And the problem with leaving him in, Al, is that you you're now going to do almost the same thing. And maybe he won't leave him in as we see Larry Bernard come out. Is if you get behind McReynolds, you're going to do the same thing you try to do Strawberry. You're going to lay it in there, try to throw a strike, aim the ball instead of throw it. So a lot of times you bring in the fresh man, especially a guy like Tim Burke, who's had an outstanding really two or three years for the for the Expos. And if you do make a move after McReynolds, if McReynolds gets on. Howard Johnson represents a tying run and then which do you who do you bring in McClure or Tim Burke Johnson a better hitter this year as a right handed batter so maybe McClure will get the call and then you bring in the guy that you most likely don't want to have in because Burke has pitched better than McClure that's so. right so why not bring Burke in now you got it what he's doing right now is saying a prayer that Martinez can go all the way as McReynolds takes a strike at the count on one. Well, McReynolds is a double play man if he does hit it on the ground. And by sending Larry Bernarth out there, you can't go out with one ball or two old count on him. You have to let Dennis face McReynolds for the entirety. Oh, one to McReynolds. Is lifted to center field and an easy play for Winningham. Two gone. Hernandez still at second and Strawberry the runner at first with two away now in the ninth inning and Johnson the switch hitting third baseman coming up. Rogers team will be with a victory five games over 500. 33 and 28 and again if the Cardinals go down tonight Montreal will be in second place by five and a half and the Mets would remain fourth. By seven and a half. Cubs dropping to third. Meanwhile, Martinez now in 15 and two thirds innings in his two starts has given up just six hits. Oh and one. You can see still great movement on that fastball. The ball started in the outside part of the plate and was literally six inches outside when Howard Johnson swung at the pitch. I would think that Buck Rogers is thinking now it's not that Martinez doesn't still have good stuff it's that the Mets have seen him four times that really enters into a manager's thinking. Oh and to the count. But you said it the first time around Howard Johnson is a great fastball hitter situational he's going to look fastball whether it's 2 0 3 1 1 2 or whatever. If you get the breaking ball like he did last time when he struck him out out of the strike zone keep it out of the middle of the plate below the knees he's going to swing it right now you want to throw it in the dirt keep it down you see right there he, Jeff Reed looks like a looks like a fastball inside nope it's a curveball one and two Hernandez is second and strawberry at first with two out of the ninth inning. Montreal on top, 4 nothing. 
trying to beat the Mets and Dwight Gooden, who worked seven innings tonight. Rogers checking out who remains on the Mets bench. Santana is due up next. And Johnson lifts it in the air to left field. Tim Raine will put it away, and the Expos move into second. And this ball club, so maligned by their fans, by other teams in a way, Wondering what in the world was going on in Montreal and even their own players. Ruby Brooks and Tim Wallach among the more vociferous in the offseason. They are now five games over 500, two games in front of the Mets, and in second place in the National League's Eastern Division. There are the totals. Martinez goes all the way to beat Gooden and will return to Montreal after this word from your local station. Our gratitude to Alan Roth for the numbers up here and Steve Hurd in the truck as you look once again at the final totals tonight. Montreal winning the opener of this four game series as they beat the Mets for nothing. The fewest hits for the Mets in any game this season in the first complete game shutout thrown against New York in 1987 as Dennis Martinez does it. Now next week on ABC's Monday Night Baseball the two clubs that are at the moment one two in the National League East Montreal at St. Louis. Others will see Kansas City taking on Oakland so check your local listings for the game in your area on Monday Night Baseball a week from tonight and a reminder ABC Sports presenting Monday Sports Night from Atlantic City with post fight interviews with Jerry Cooney and Michael Spinks upcoming also a chat with Brian Bosworth about his being drafted by the Seattle Seahawks in the NFL supplemental draft those two stories and others coming your way on Monday sports night following Nightline and we'll be back in Montreal right after this. This is Corey McFerrin in New York. Update on the Pirates and Cardinals at Bush Stadium. The worst and the best in the National League East. Top of the second inning, former Cardinal Mike Lavalier will crush the baseball. Deep to right field. Now watch John Morris go way up in the air against the wall. He is unable to make the catch. And around comes Jim Morrison to score. Pirates lead 1-0. Now, to the seventh inning of play. Tie game at one. Andy Van Slyke crushes it to the corner in right field. This is heading for the wall. That's Belliard coming around and the Pirates lead by a 2-1 score. Now in the eighth inning, Mike Diaz against Pat Perry, and Diaz crushes the ball to the seats in left field for Diaz's 10th home run. The Bucks win it 3-1. That's the final. Mike Dunn, a three-hitter, his second win on the year. In the final score of Montreal 4, the Mets nothing. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, Tim McCarver is saying good night from Olympic Stadium. ABC's Monday Night Baseball has been brought to you by Coors. The beer with a difference worth tasting. Coors is the one. By the heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. And by Kellogg's Brand Flakes Cereal. Join us for ABC News Nightline immediately following your local news. And then following Nightline, ABC Sports presents Monday Sports Night with host Al Troutwig. Sports Night will have the first live post-fight interview with heavyweights Michael Spinks and Jerry Cooney. Also featured heavyweight champion Mike Tyson, comedian Robert Klein, golfer Greg Norman, and more. Monday Sports Night following Nightline. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.